Okay, yes, sir. Oh. Right, but personal, personal email or D49 email? That's what we're asking. Okay, because he just said personal, so I got confused. But I'm on already, so I'm not in trouble yet. Okay, so board members, if as you're waiting, as we start to begin, if you have not yet logged into Cascade, um, start that process so that when we get to the item, we're not spending a whole bunch of time waiting for everyone to get that screen up, um, which isn't for a bit, so it's okay. Um, and with that, we are ready to begin our work session. And our first item of business is a transportation org chart with Mr. Ridgeway and Mr. Petrao. Brett Ridgeway, Chief Business Officer, uh, wanted to update you all as to how we have brought the transportation department into this new school year, uh, following some hiring uh, over the summer. Of course, just going back all the way to uh, last spring when we had our unfortunate loss with with Gene Hammond and uh, Jack and and a number of the folks, you know, really carried us through the rest of the year. But we went through a hiring process early in the summer uh, that I picked up uh, as part of uh, part of my duties for the summer. Uh, included hiring hiring Jack as the transportation director, and then we also uh, added added another uh, staff manager, kind of to backfill since he was an internal replacement, and we we're able to do that from from the candidate pool. Uh, we had we had uh, someone who you, you'll meet here tonight who uh, was uh, willing that that role here. But as as we got into this process of the course of summer, I spent some time with Jack uh, and with Robert Sparks. You know, talking about the organization, about you know, just kind of stepping back and looking about it, because again, uh, every every change is opportunity, right? And so, how do, how do we do we simply exactly replicate, or do we do we make any adjustments? So, as we talked about this earlier in the summer, we went from we we decided to move a little bit on the structure from this prior structure that you see on the top page, which had some verticality to it, with with a you know the, the transportation director supervising only the transportation manager who's supervising a lot of stuff. And then below, you had you had the, all the drivers and paras. They a lot of people who, I don't want to say didn't have any direct reporting line, but they 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 had various various different different reasons. And so as we talked about it, we said, well, let's 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 try and bring some some clarity to it. Let's try and establish a good apex team, as is our style with team team management. Uh, and so we went uh, towards something that you see there on the bottom, uh, which has you know, four key uh, leadership areas. Uh, of the department, uh, all reporting and directly to the director, so that there's great visibility, great transparency, and great independence for those roles. Um, uh, you know, into into Jack uh, as as the leader of the department. So, um, I'll, I'll let Jack speak a little bit to how how this is sorting out uh, so far and working so far, and then also give him a chance to introduce these folks that are, are fulfilling these roles so far. Hello, board members. Um, so tonight, uh, who I brought here is our team, and it's Carlos is our newest member, as and he and uh, he's just been hired on, and he's uh, um, like a staffing manager. So the green boxes, the green backs. The green okay, boxes. right, right. The green, green, green and, staff manager. And, and um, so as you guys know, we've we've been having. I don't know if you noticed the little sign that I put on the side of the building out here. The tiny little sign. Did you guys see that? about hiring bus drivers <laughs> so carlos has already helped us with that quite a bit since he's been here in a short time um and in doing so he has created a ton of work for my training department all of a sudden <laughs> and and our lead trainer is uh patty mize over there and she has got a big job in front of her um, in the past, Patty has been doing all of the interviewing and hiring and all and managing all of the training. And it's a lot of work for one person. Um, Car with the addition of Carlos, it always it gives us a better opportunity for just the drivers and the Paris to have somebody to go to other than I have this problem, I have to go to this person, I have this problem, I have to go to that person uh, is, is kind of how it was. So we're hoping that Carlos can help with that culture in our department and um, um, 
help us retain the drivers that we're getting, so to speak. So um, I also um, have Randall Briggs here, who is the, the fleet manager. And so Rand Randall manages all aspects of the fleet um, and the shop, the fueling, the buses, uh, the mechanics, the parts, um, most, um, he's, he's also got a very big job. It's a very large portion of our budget um, to keep um, efficient. And he does a really good job at it. And uh, last, last but absolutely not least is Robert Sparks, who um, kept, kept me on track through the last six months as far as keeping the daily operations of our department running every day. Um, the, the hundreds of things that come up every day. Um, and it's that's been the biggest change for me moving into the director position, having my hands on that daily to make sure this happens, that happens, this happens every day. And Robert has taken that over. Um, <laughs> I've told him this before, better than I did, <laughs> okay? So he's, he's really handled it well. And um, he's, uh, he's really helped this department a lot, including me personally. So um, that's the new team that we're presenting in front of us. And um, that's hopefully what we're moving towards. So. so what are you asking of us so right now? Really, what we wanted to present this to you because, you know, I, technically, I believe this is an extra management person when you look uh, at the number of managers we have on this level than we had before. I'm not convinced that it's extra cost necessarily because I think there are other things that that even out in it in terms of the depth and lower down in the staffing so basically it's, it's kind of going from from to, to this style which has which is two managers and two supervisors where from where before we had one manager and 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 what three or four supervisors something like that so three supervisors so it's 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 reconfiguring that and it's we're kind of just you know looking for your um your opinion of us formalizing and kind of finishing off and formalizing all of this uh, structure that, that we've kind of put into place in kind of an interim basis to this point. So looking for concerns um, to that. Okay, so it is an addition of a position. It's an addition of an FTE, just so that I'm understanding, is it or is I, it not, or I is think, it? Yeah, yeah, I would say yes, but I would hedge on it. But I would, in, in the end, I would say yes. Yes, that's why I said in the end, I'll say yes. Well, and that's, I can't tell from the diagram, right? Because right. the diagram's got a whole bunch of different things, but I don't think you had an individual position in each of those things. Some of those are more than one person's job on the top structure, I think, right? So the way in which we're looking at the top structure isn't really comparable to the bottom structure in terms of understanding an org chart because it doesn't tell us number of positions, it tells us the types of work being done on the top one, and the bottom one is actually an accurate descriptor of position, correct? The bottom one is, yeah. Right, but the top one is not, correct? Just correct. so that, okay. Um, so personally for me, although I, I understand this piece, in the future I would appreciate if the diagrams represented the same information so that I could see that more clearly. Um, because on the second one on the bottom, it's describing what they're responsible for, and it's equivalent to four positions on the top. I can't tell what, who does what, and, and how it breaks out. So for me, that would be helpful for analyzing that type of thing. Um, and then my second question is, I'm assuming that this means job descriptions should be coming to us if we say, go on ahead with this? You know, we already have a transportation manager job description, so... I don't necessarily know that, and that's why that's why I have this discussion this way is because I don't know that just going a job description process would have brought this forward as clearly as as what we're trying to do here. I think because, you need because right now we both, have, right? We, right now we have a, jo a, a, a job description for transportation manager. It just previously was filled by one person, and now we would have two of those. So you don't need to bring us a new job description because. The transportation manager job description will cover what you want this org chart to look like. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. 
job, uh, transportation managers. So if their duties are different, shouldn't there be two distinct job descriptions that describe each position? I mean, you know, that's, that's, that's what, my, I think that's, that's one of the things we still need to. We, Paul, help me because it kind of seems to me can that I we, I, I, you can too, but I also want to hear from my HR guy. I, I hate to put everybody on the spot, but it doesn't mean I think this is a bad idea, Brett. I'm just saying if we're differentiating duties, it sounds like we have a differentiation in job description. But I'm Paul Anderson, Director of Human Resources. Um, I, I, I would need to study the tr the transportation manager job description to and, and review it in the context of this. And I and I have uh, had some um, some review of this um, up to this point. I think I think I'm going to come to the conclusion that, that it, it is written generally enough, broadly enough that it's going to encompass the functions uh, that both individuals are performing. So it probably it ends up being a, which I think for a model going forward actually makes more sense than having more narrowly defined job descriptions. Uh, and I think the, the reason that it's going to fit both is that in the past, that, that the one person filling the role was overseeing these other functions. So they're already in, encompassed in, in the existing job description, I believe. Okay, anybody else have any other questions? Kevin, anything? Do you have anything? Okay, because you can't always tell, and sometimes I need to ask you specifically. <laughs> that would be the spam, I swear. We've had that happen multiple times, yeah, <laughs> as you send it to the spam people. Okay, so does anyone have any further questions? Okay. So what I think we're being asked for then is consensus to look at, okay, so what are we asking? Because my sheet says to move the transportation, transportation logistics manager position forward, but you're saying it's not really, I have two positions with the exact same name as what we're going to have on the org chart. And you're splitting up the duties, not a transportation logistics manager position does it, then, does right? It say, does it say bring a job description forward? It says transportation logistics manager position. Right. So Okay, right. so, so help talking me about out. job description, we're basically saying, can we formalize this structure and, and hire this position on a, on a non-interim basis, on a permanent basis? That's what it's saying. I like this structure. It makes sense to me. If it works for you guys, it makes sense to me. You know what you need in your department, so I'm good with it. So we're asking to move the structure forward, yeah. not a position forward, really. We're asking to move ahead with the structure, yes, and okay. make, make the hire. Okay, I'm just trying to figure out what the dope. Okay. Other questions, concerns? I need a consensus on whether people want to move it forward. Okay, can you speak, guys? Like nods and no, I, I need help because yes, I can't see forward, everyone. Please. Thank you. Yay. Thank you. Yeah, what do you say? Okay, thank you. So then we will move it forward. Okay, all right. So now, thank you, guys. So we're on to the Peak Partners Leadership Academy report. I'm Jennifer. I'm Jennifer Johnson, co-chair with Matt Barrett for Peak Partners Leadership Academy. I'm going to give you a wrap up of what we did year two as we prepare to go into year three. Um, I think we'll both readily acknowledge that year one, we birthed it. We had 17 participants. Year two, we started jogging and running. We had 13 participants while 20 were in the in the queue. So we kind of want to do a review of, do a SWOT analysis on what we experienced during year two. And then Matt will talk about uh, the, the online leadership component that we offered. Sorry, that font's not clear. I'm not going to go through all of this with you, but strengths. Year one, we had many more community leaders attendance was phenomenal. We stretched out year two and reached out to more businesses. 
timing and schedule became a challenge that we were probably not as tuned into. Remember, we rolled this from January to March. Our goal is to get year one, we did seven sessions. Year two, we did seven sessions in person and eight online, so we rolled into 15 sessions. And I think while we were hoping to get business involved, and they were, their work schedules and their businesses certainly called them at times that we weren't always prepared for. So the strengths, we definitely had active engagement from, from the um, business side. There were more questions for Brett and his numbers than we probably have ever had. Peter, they asked for your slides too. But certainly there were questions about how the finances work that we probably didn't have as much in year one. So we're still learning. What we think we figured out was that community may know more about the schools. Businesses wanted to know more about the business side of it. So we're hoping they hit a happy medium when we go into um, to year three. Meeting board, and thank you, Peter, Brett, and Marie, and meeting all of you at the board meeting, which was our first session for PPLA2 worked. They got to know you by name. They got to look up who you were and what you did. And that was absolutely a benefit that we kind of worked into it. It ended up being a different day. We normally do PPLA on Tuesday. It was a Thursday board meeting, so they fit into the schedule and it seemed to work. Some of the challenges I've mentioned already, schedules. Business owners had schedules, especially as we got into tax season. Um, they were being called to duty. So we're looking at what we might do to have um, a recording that they might participate in after the session if they can't attend. So it was one of the challenges. Business leaders wanted more time for leadership. So we're hoping this coming, our, our final year of the initiative, to do a pre-test or pre-review of the leader or leaders that they'll speak to in person. So we can do a pre and post to see what is it you know before we put the leaders in front of you from the district. And then what is it you know once we're finished? Because they were certainly using the language that our chief academic and, and business officers were using. Um, we also decided that one of the weaknesses, we put all of the zone leaders in front of them at one time. We're gonna put the zone leaders, hopefully with the principal at their particular school, as opposed to, there was a content overload they were hearing an awful lot. Um, so we got some lessons that we learned from the, from the weaknesses side of it. Um, we also, one of the weaknesses, we had a limited outreach to applicants. I think we were kind of tiptoeing to make sure we get the right folks. Our outreach has already started. Marie was very kind that um, I helped facilitate uh, El Paso Council PTA this past weekend. And Marie made an announcement to um, our members from Falcon and we've got three that are already interested. So we're outreaching in a very different way than we have um, in the past. Opportunities. At the PTA meeting, those 120 young folks, sorry, young folks, wanted to know if we had 50 participants, would that be a problem? We tell them a problem we'd love to have. So we're tasking them to help us as we'll task each of you as an opportunity. Each one, reach one, send us one. If we had 50, that would certainly be an absolute benefit. We've got 30 trained now. If we can get another 50, that would be absolutely ideal. We're continuing to build strategic partners. Um, our 7-Eleven, our, our Sheriff's Department, um, Mountain View. We are certainly working hard to make sure that we connect our leaders with our school district particularly focusing on those folks that maybe live in the district but just haven't been engaged. So opportunities certainly exist for, um, for that. We're hoping to use the district website a little better this year to do a headline. Um, folks didn't know always where to find it as a weakness, but the opportunity is to put that website and, and our information front and center early on. We'll recruit September through mid-November put a class together by December and kick off in January. Threats, I'm not sure I can use time and schedule as a threat because we all have it, but certainly that was a challenge. And again, the reason we truncated January through March, what our decision was, if we can keep them engaged every other week, we're more likely to keep them engaged. 
as opposed to expanding over the entire year. One of the challenges we do have is that with no skin in the game, sometimes it's easy not to attend. We are this year for PPLA 3 planning to put a list in front of them of opportunities in our zones and get them to commit by session number two, which of those two sessions they'll participate in. So we're hoping that will be something that works for us. Um, recommendations, kind of said, we're gonna work with the zones in a way that we haven't before, asking our zones to give us some recommendations. Um, confirm all of our presenters and where we're going to be by October. So when we're marketing this, folks know exactly where we're going what the, the times and dates are and who they'll be hearing from. Offering the participant opportunities in January. We'll do a first session at the board meeting again in January, which is absolutely beneficial, especially when they met with you and broke bread. It worked very well. And we'll begin recruiting with a pre and a post or a pre-assessment, a final assessment. We'd love to have 25. We'd be in glory if we got 50. With that, Matt's gonna talk about the online part of our Leadership Academy. Uh, Matt Barrett, uh, co-facilitator of PPLA. Uh, let's see, so, uh, let's see whether I arrow forward. So one of the things that we looked at was we've got this component where they interact with the district, the leadership, the various parts of it, and they learn about that. Also give an opportunity to feedback, but the peak partner to leadership uh, academy, the leadership was really lacking, we found in the first uh, time, not because of our lack of preparation, or lack of effort, but we had such dynamic questions about the district, it was hard to kind of shift gears and say, we're gonna stop this great interaction so that we can give you just a quick 15 minutes on being a community leader. So we restructured that, we took the feedback from PPLA one, redesigned it for PPLA two, and, uh, and put together a, a solid program. And I'll talk about that in a second. But the concept behind this is really, if we build leaders that can lead our community uh, better, because we have stronger leaders, we'll have a stronger community. And so that's really the element, or I guess the drive behind why we want to uh, include leadership into this. Uh, this new hybrid format I was mentioning uh, it worked out tremendously. We had them go home in the off weeks at their own time, participate in lessons, watch a video, uh, self-assessment surveys, all different components of leadership training, bring them back in. We would start the evening off with some in-class discussion. And I've got to give special thanks to Brian Green. Uh, Brian did just an absolute tremendous job uh, tutoring us and training us and how to use Schoology and uh, I don't know that I'm quite there yet. We may have to call him a couple more times, but it really was a, a huge asset. And I think that goes back to the concept of this team leadership component. Uh, his partnership in this was, was very valuable. This is the, the content that we presented to them. Uh, what is community leadership, levels of leadership, characteristics of community leadership, and on down the line. The essence is really let's teach them what it is to be a leader outside of the workplace where you don't have a paycheck to dangle in front of an employee to say, you better do it because I'm a leader and I sign your paycheck. And instead look at it from the standpoint of, I'm in my cul-de-sac, you know, flipping burgers on 4th of July, and I wanna lead you into a better place, lead our district into a better place. And so that was the kind of the, the overall arch that we took with, the, uh, uh, took with this. Um, the, the results of it have, have really been good. We've got a number of graduates involved in different committees um, and other leadership positions, a number of them inside the district, but of course, a number of them outside as well. We'll love to put you in the on-ramp for that. If you just wanna take a higher position within a, a, a nonprofit board, that'll help our community as well as we develop stronger leaders everywhere. I think that's all we've got for that. So questions? Is there a follow-up program? I mean, you've got, what, 40 graduates now? I mean, the follow-up to continue, is there a systematic follow-up engagement program? Yeah, so traditionally what we do is after it's over, we go through a graduation process. Uh, Jennifer and I will meet with them individually, sit down, coffee or breakfast, lunch, and, and figure out where they want to get engaged and what they want to do. And we kind of handhold them through the next step of that uh, to get them there. There isn't a formalized, like a, a, a graduate leadership academy, if you will, or a, a second level of, of classes that they can come to and attend. Uh, I know we've talked about that. Uh, at this point, the original intent was let's stand up PPLA and then let's figure out what the, the next part of that's gonna look like. So does that answer your question? 
Yeah, it does. I've actually, I've, I've met with a couple of your, sure, yeah, your yeah. academy yep. graduates afterwards and they're it was intelligent, energetic people. And I just um, selfishly don't want to see those people escape our grasp. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I want to continue to say, quite frankly, I want one of them to replace everybody here over time. And, <clears> and that's the perfect, I mean, this is a funnel to bring them in. I want to make sure we're building this. And, um, and, and that's a good point. Like that funnel, as whether it's a, a board of director, whether it's a, a DAC or a SAC committee or a budget committee, whenever those positions become available, we tag those people with so-and-so is interested in a board position, just not quite ready for it yet, whether it's lifestyle or open seat or whatever the case is. Uh, but we continually circle back around with them. One of the things Jennifer and I are, are looking at doing this year is how do we take our alumni and more or less create, you know, kind of a, a mini version of a, an alumni association. We're planning on inviting them into the first round of this, perhaps also bringing them back into the graduation and keeping them engaged. Do we set them up as a mentor? Uh, and while we certainly appreciate your involvement with the, the people you've met with, wouldn't it be even greater to multiply that leadership beyond just what the board of directors is already doing and having other leaders already established to mentor the, the new graduates? Is there a built-in expectation of the people who participate in the process that, I mean, is it, it seems like it's more of a hope than an expectation. Is that a way in which that once they start is maybe halfway through is, yeah. hey, you know, our expectation of doing this is not only to give, give you some tools and encourage leadership, but also that there will be a follow through or that you will be, and we will work hard, whether it be you or board or anybody to connect yeah. to, whether it be a, a DAC or a SAC or some way, shape or form into, into the district. Yeah, so I think you're right. We cast the hope. We don't cast the expectation. We hope that they get involved. We show them the potential for the on-ramp. We show them the potential to, to take a stronger role in our community, whatever that role looks like. But we don't say, listen, it's week three, everybody's signing up, you know, so so prick your finger and sign in blood. It's, it's not that hard of a sell. But, but our goal this year is to put a list of opportunities in front of them on the front end. So Brittany McBicker, Dak. Um, Sandy Esperson, El Paso Council PTA. She just ran her 120, her first meeting, and the words were falling out of her mouth and kept pointing to her binder that we had given her on leadership skills. And, and Dave Aaron, who is already in position um, with Eastern Plains Chamber of Commerce. So we've got some models we're figuring out now. Is it an ad hoc committee you want to be on? Is it a DAC? Is it a SAC? We're trying to get them to look at their lifestyles, what their availability is, because what we beg them to do is don't sign up for it if you can't attend. We're trying not to allow them to step into an opportunity where they're not going to fulfill the need. So this year, we're hoping, we're hoping, we will put in front of them a list of opportunities from our zones and ask them to sign and commit by session two on what their plans are, either during the time we're together or at least by the end of the school year. So we are gonna roll that out a little differently. We're hoping to get a lot more activity. We are in touch with, I got four or five I stay in touch with. What am I doing? What can I do? So we think we're gonna formalize it with kind of a little mini contract and see where we go from there. Well, and, and I think honestly, there's a piece of this is developing people who take formal roles in the district, but a piece of it is also helping the 60% who don't have children and who have no connection, connection, understand who we are. And so ultimately, if someone commits to going through this and says, you know what, I don't really want to volunteer in anything or can't volunteer in anything right now, but they have a better understanding and respect for who our district is, the impact that has in our community for helping our community understand who we are, because they're, you know, they're, they're going to be at the barbecues in their neighborhood and at the active older adults group at the rec center, and they're going to hear people gripe, and they're going to be some of the people who step up and say good things about us because they say, well, actually, I went to this thing, and this is how it works. And so there's a benefit even if they don't necessarily take on a formal role, but I was also hearing you say that, like, the business connection folks had different types of questions and wanted different kinds of information than people who had other connections to us. Do you see this as possibly evolving into something where we're differentiating those expectations and running one that is a, or, you know, one that is for the, the people who are involved, like the Brittany McVickers and Sandy S. Barsons, who already have some connection to the district and want to learn more about the district as a whole versus business leaders who are trying to 
also connect in a different way or do you think it's better to keep them mixed or um because there may also even be a timing thing right like if tax season is also awful for business owners um i can tell you mom season isn't quite as bad then as it is at the beginning of the school year so maybe you know maybe beginning of the year is better when they're not in their tax season for a business owner but February when like next to nothing's going on because good luck with outdoor sports with little kids or anything else going on in the middle of winter other than the snow cancellations of the PPLA. I don't know, but you so, know, so, those are some ideas. So you hit a number of nails exactly on the head. Uh, your example of kind of that cul-de-sac leadership is, is spot on. And that's, I was originally going to say that, but you said it all for me. Um, the idea of splitting it into two groups, I think is possible. If we grow it, do we start tailoring it for the types of people who are interested because maybe their interest and knowledge bases are different? Yeah. You look this way and I'm so hesitant. Um, I, I think we want to be careful about growing it too fast and, and narrowing it too tightly because people come into leadership roles every year and I think that's a great opportunity as people come into a leadership role, they stabilize after a year or two. That's right when we want to bring them in. And that's a that's a fairly steady number. It'll grow as our community grows. But I think it would be possible to overbuild it and then have a significant drop off for a couple of years. And what we really want is steady, predictable cohorts coming into potentially formal leadership roles, coming into community conversational leadership. So I, I think Figuring out, and we're starting to get a sense, we'll have a better sense after a third cohort, but figuring out what's about the right size. It's probably somewhere between 15 and 30. And that's a, if we had 50 a year, we'd have more people that want formal roles than there are formal roles. And so then you're, you're creating some undesirable competition. So I think part of what we're learning is that there is a, a steady state that we should manage to. <coughs> And it's yeah. helping us. Year one, Matt Meister did much of the logistics. Year two, we took it. Year three, we're running. We got it. So we've had some adjustments in how we do business as well. Well, and given that pieces of this are about board potential recruitment, um, are we looking at our balance geographically um, to start thinking about, you know, um, how we, how we, how we allocate it to various director districts or regions so that we're developing people in areas that we're going to need them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, in the, uh, I felt like a telemarketer, uh, as we were going into PPLA2, I probably made over 100 and some cold calls 
and, and targeted specific businesses or specific organizations and, uh, and went specifically kind of powers in the alley area knowing that there was you know had been traditionally a little bit of deficiency out of that area uh in, in leadership role so have done that as well so yeah but that's that's a good point a good reminder and we're working hard in falcon zone since that's been one of our challenges when it comes to community so so yes we absolutely pay attention to zip codes and where folks are from falcon zone has generated a lot of board members though whether or not they were you know whether or not we have all been you know as as good as we could be in those roles but um, we tend to be the angsty zone <laughs> and so, yeah I live there, so I can come in about me. I've been asked what water am I drinking frequently enough by other people to know that you know my area has a bit of a reputation. Um. Change the subject. <laughs> <laughs> We're seeing the fruits of what you're doing. We appreciate it. I mean, it is good. It, it really is. When I first said, "We're excited," and we, we love seeing it. Um, We're seeing more crew encouraging involvement from our people and I want to take that the threat the history of the past let's just get that out of our dialogue because it doesn't exist and no sense of it anymore thank you okay anything further you need from us at this point yeah you should recruit about six people each you have three of mine already because all the people all the PTA people were the peeps I got this weekend we, we, in all cases, we do appreciate your contacts, your community, people that you know, because your circles are different than our circles. And it, it doesn't have to be a hard sell, it doesn't have to be anything. We just, anything you can do to send this people will certainly help diversify our pool of applicants beyond who Jennifer and I already know. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, I think we're ready for our assessment update with Ms. Grannis. Good evening, Kathleen Graham, coordinator of academic performance. And tonight I have a summary of all the 2017 assessments uh, in less than 20 minutes. Scuba divers are trained in the dangers of alternaveric vertigo, extreme dizziness that can result in the loss of orientation and confusion of directionality. When vertigo strikes a diver, time is at the essence. Our student assessment data gives us orientation and a sense of equilibrium, ensuring that we're headed in the right direction. And time is in, of the essence of, for our students, too. Today, I'll give you the latest information on the student achievement in District 49 to guide you as you guide the district initiatives. Our big rocks and our compass guide our decisions. Learning is at the top of the compass. Assessment drives learning by influencing instruction. Today, we'll focus on summative state assessments, but state assessments should just give us one data point or uh, part of those data points. Educators use multiple measures of student progress over the course of the school year. So this slide shows the assessments from last year. Uh, the data we're reporting on tonight are from these assessments. Uh, DLM and COALT are alternate forms of the state assessments for students with significant cognitive disabilities. I'm thinking that you're pretty familiar with um, most of the assessments there, the CSAM, Science, Social Studies, PSAT, and SAT. But I also wanted to bring your attention to uh, the assessments that will be given this year in District 49, and the changes are in bold. Uh, this year, CMAS, ELA, and MAP uh, will be an assessment uh, formally PARC. Uh, it will be modified and to uh, this, uh, the, a modified version of the same assessment that we gave for the past three years. So there will be adjustments to the number of questions, the unit times of testing, and possibly the number of days of testing. Um, but the questions are still from that same vendor, from Pearson. And uh, we'll have uh, a little bit more information about the exact um, number of days and times soon. Uh, this year, the test will no longer be referred to um, as PARC, but CMAS, um, ELA MAP, and students will be tested in grades 3 through 8, uh, but no longer uh, at ninth grade. And science remains the same. For social studies, we'll give the test to the sample school still in 4th and 7th grade, uh, but additionally, we'll give the assessment to all 11th graders statewide. Uh, this year, ninth graders will take the PSAT 8-9, 
a version of the Berkeley Scale College Board Suite Assessments that align to PSAT 10 and SAT. And uh, you're probably familiar that when we talk about on track, we're talking about the students in the top two performance levels there of exceeded and met expectations. So some trends from this past year. Um, the highlight of the positive trends are ELA, there was a steady increase in achievement across three years in fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, and particularly eighth grade. We also saw a strong increase when there were students on track in ELA cohorts of students. Uh, our quasi-longitudinal data shows, um, like for example, when a student was in fifth grade, um, compared to uh, when they were in fourth grade and third grade that was um, that same group of students. And eighth grade was the biggest celebration of our cohort students, as you can see, 11% uh, increase of students on track. And uh, so we have a record high um, group of students uh, moving uh, into high school this year on track in ELA. This firm foundation in reading and writing will strengthen our students along their pathways and support their launch success. So I showed you this table on the right last year uh, on a very simple level. The table on the left uh, shows comparing to, and you can see the columns at the top, uh, the compared to last year and compared to the state. Uh, it highlights the application of the reading skills that even more of our students are demonstrating at every grade level. Our students are scoring higher than they did last year in ELA, and at almost every level, our students are outscoring the students statewide. Can I get a whoop? Yay! <laughs> that is good news. That's good news. <laughs> And that paints a bit of a different picture. A positive trend we're seeing is in our, in our middle school and our high school math students. They're increasing incrementally. And uh, so you can see the same column headings here in this one in 16 and then 17 on the left. So let's look into this at uh, some further depth. So uh, looking across years, this graph uh, shows orange is ELA and math is in green for third, fourth, and fifth grades. And you can see the black bar indicates the state percentage of students that scored, met, or exceeded in those bands. Um, fifth grade ELA can really see that nice trend uh, district wide and statewide. Uh, in fifth grade um, from last year, they increased 9% uh, in District 49. Uh, trends are less apparent in math but really excited about the opportunities for growth this year as we launch our strategic initiative of primary math. The trends in middle school ELA are positive in validating the work our schools are doing. In 17, 52% uh, of our eighth graders stored on track performance in the, the on track performance bands, and that's a three year high for the grade level and it's a record high for the district. Uh, so that um, you could see the percentage increase across uh, sixth grade ELA um, and eighth grade ELA, oh, but eighth and even seventh grade ELA. Um, sixth grade nine percent increase over the years, uh, seventh grade four percent, and eighth grade eleven percent. And um, I think this one's exciting too. Uh, this is looking at um, cohorts of students across years. And so starting at the bottom, the class of 2021, the eighth grade students um, that are now ninth graders grew 18% in ELA over the course of those three years. Um, and so that's, that's pretty tremendous. But in across all the cohorts, we see positive trends in ELA. I want to tell you a little bit about our district's growth resource. It's an indication of what happens in between the assessments, unlike the achievement data that's point in time. School and district growth rates are determined by the growth percentiles of individual students, specifically the median student growth percentile. Growth rates are independent of achievement rates, so students at all achievement levels are just as likely to have high growth as they are low growth. And as a point of reference, the state of um, the state's meeting growth percentile is usually about 50 with some variations. 
So unfortunately, there's an issue with this slide. It was a dynamic slide, so I apologize, but I will paint you a picture of it. Okay, um, what it shows is really exciting things at the middle school level. Um, and so in District 49 last year, students in 6th, 7th, 7th, and 8th grade had higher growth rates than the state. In 7th grade and 8th grade, uh, the students grew faster than the state rate in math also. So in looking at a breakout, so that's what's happening with the breakout is over it. But the breakout shows our uh, traditional middle schools, but we see that same kind of um, growth, uh, exceeding the state growth rate at all three of the traditional um, schools. So that, and, and we see it in ELA and math. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know that you have a laser pointer on that remote you're holding, and if you want to, you can show the board. I know you'd have to look off of your screen up there, but you can show them what you're talking about, that, that being above that midline and, and the growth that we're seeing yeah. over the grades. So. so they imposed over each other, but that's where you can see the three um, schools, the three uh, middle schools, um, which is really exciting. Yeah. There, the pretty tremendous growth. And then the, the farther back is just the, it should have been out of it. My apologies. It, if it was in PowerPoint mode, it would look different. <laughs> so what is the top, like, that's where I'm confused, so what is the top? Okay, so the top part is uh, the average median growth percentile of students in the district. And so the, and the it's only, um, oh, is that like fourth through eighth grades then on the top? Yes, okay. yes. Okay, and that's so, where you can see so sixth, nice. seventh, and eighth grade are beating that state trend. Okay, so it's fourth through eighth, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth on the top. Yes. And then the bottom data is the elementary, so we're seeing it um, right in the middle, sorry. Yeah, yeah. and then we, okay. you know, we wanted to dig into a little more and see like, is this just one school really carrying the weight of all of our middle school students? And I think, you know, statewide, they're not seeing the same kind of trend we're seeing in middle school. So something is happening in middle school, it's really exciting. And so, uh, Well, the next slide is um, about the social studies sampling, which you all are pretty familiar with. Okay, yeah. Um, and that was just in, in an effort to reduce um, the amount of testing for students. Uh, but then this year, statewide, the all 11th graders will take social studies because they've been skipped for a couple of years here. So the trend uh, in uh, science and social studies on the next um, slide. Uh, we've made uh, incremental steady growth across years in science. And social studies is really hard to analyze because each year different groups of students are taking it at different schools. But um, here you can see the trends in science across years and um, last year's social studies. So definitely last year was the highest of the four years. Oh, yeah. no, good. Okay. Okay. And then on to uh, the College Board of Assessments. Uh, in 17, we take these. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about the subtests. So, um, and these are across both um, PSAT and SAT. Evidence based reading writing measures a range of reading writing language skills. One of the subtests is called the command of evidence, and students dig into passages. Um, and they find evidence to answer questions, and then they go really beyond the text. And words in context is a test of vocabulary that goes beyond a traditional vocabulary test. Analysis of history, social studies, and science is a part of the reading test, and it has passages in those fields of history, so social studies and science, and the answers are based on the content stated in or implied in the passage not in science or social studies content that they studied in school. And then some of the items, uh, students are responding in writing, and their writing is uh, scored on expression of ideas and the use of standard English conventions. And then in math, um, students are measured in math fluency, conceptual understanding, and students' ability to apply math in three specific sessions, uh, sections in the heart of algebra, which focuses on the mastery of linear, linear equations and systems, problem solving, and data analysis, which is about being quantitative, 
quantitatively literate, and then Passport to Advanced Math, which features questions that require a manipulation of context, uh, complex equations. And uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, this year ninth graders will take the PSAT 8 9. So we'll have uh, a really nice alignment across high school. So um, here, uh, the, just sharing with you the College Board uh, that makes both of those assessments created readiness benchmarks that indicates that um, threshold of proficiency. And since they're aligned, we can use the test to help students along their pathways and determine areas of focus. And so readiness for a career would indica indicate um, attainment of skills that students would need to be proficient in the workplace. And college readiness would indicate students' ability to pass college bearing um, subclasses uh, in the same subjects. And so uh, trends in PSAT, we observed a small but steady increase in achievement from 16 to 17. And so here you can see uh, across the two years, our PSAT students in 10th grade, um, and then uh, the left is evidence-based reading writing and then math, uh, and that 2% increase across years. And so um, in 17, we had 15% of our students on track in evidence-based reading and writing, and then 27% in math. And then this just uh, shows some of the composite <coughs> trends uh, in our second year broken down to our comprehensive non-ABC high schools. And these schools use PSAT and SAT measures in the UIP. Uh, and this was the first year for PPEC being a new school, so that's why they only have one bar. Uh, overall, we're pretty stable. As an early college, PPEC stands out. Uh, breaking down a little further to all the high schools and the subscores um, of evidence based reading, writing, and then math. You can see the trends across all the districts. And then uh, breaking down to SAT, this was the first year of SAT, and the graph shows a uh, breakout of just the comprehensive non ABC schools first. And then um, that uh, final graph there uh, is the SAT subscores. And that's all of our schools. The state's announced that we're no longer giving PARC, but the new ELA and math test will be based on the same question bank. So the data across years uh, should be comparable. Consistency helps us look at trends to monitor student learning. Our work is to continue to use these data, but also to rely on our own portfolio of assessments to guide our daily decisions with student learning at the school level, but ultimately at the classroom level to lead our students into the future. And for now, we will use these data to keep our equilibrium. The data affirms the work we are doing and guides the work to be done. We appreciate the orientation and directionality of the board uh, that, can, that provides us uh, to continue to be the best choice for students, families, and employees to learn, work, and lead. Thank you. Okay, questions? <coughs> okay, I'll go. Um, noticing some trends, at least elementary school wise, this is all public school. What about our charter schools, specifically elementary schools? Is that data going to be shown or proven? Or so, all the data that, that I showed is including our charters as well for, for CMAC. For all of the ELA, <coughs> science and social studies, all of our schools are included in that. That's and a good question. And then for high school, though, we'll have, like, for instance, uh, Van Lewis Preparatory Academy. Is that something that's going to be included in future data for us Absolutely. to see and recognize? Right? Absolutely. Yeah. That's a good question. Thank you for asking that. All your other charts show what the state average was, but the SAT did not. Yes. Yeah, something to know. I'm sorry I have that. that. No, 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 that's okay. I'm going to back up to, let's, do you want to look at it here? Yes. Now if I push this, am I going to, okay. Um, so on this graph, the mean score for the state was 1,014. Um, so that puts it, that's 20. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So yeah, right in here. And then the district average is 927. And although this graph is only showing uh, those, the comprehensive non-AEC, 
the district average includes all of the schools. Okay, so that 927 would naturally be a summation of the graph we're seeing here no, the graph. because it includes the AEC kids who are a significant number. And I don't, I don't have a good graph that shows across years on APCs, but um, Gold had a nice growth um, from last year. Um, most of the APCs, I think, had a growth from last year. Um, Patriot, I think, maybe it was up like about um, five, five points or something like that. So uh, I think maybe Gold was 10, 10 or 13 points. And then if we look on uh, this graph and the subscores, we can break it down there to the the state. The state scored 513 in evidence-based reading writing, which is just uh, right up in there, and in math 500, which is the C, and then um, 477 in evidence-based reading writing and 450 in math. So we're a little behind the state, but but both of those numbers include the AC average. Exactly. Yeah, again, that's right? the all okay. okay. So I think it for us it would be helpful maybe to see a, a bar of the state data on a, a future yeah. graph of this, just because then then we're differentiating because the when we look at this graph and have if we have the bars that represent the state at the same place, we can see how our comprehensive schools match. Um, and so can our community versus if we take the, you know, whatever news agency chooses to report district averages, um, which really don't tell the whole story of our district, it would be nice to have that to point to because, you know, looking at that, kind of eyeballing it, it means we're, we're probably a little lower than the state on math, but not too much. And we're, most of our schools are right about there on the evidence-based reading and writing, maybe a little low. but. You know, I can't, I'm just eyeballing, but we have to be pretty close based on those numbers because it looks like most of our comprehensives are right around 500. Um, we'll look at the data and submit them through Donna. So yeah, that you guys can see what that looks like because I think that's, that would make it a lot clearer. It would, yeah, it would just, it would be helpful and it also helps us conversations when various newspapers print articles that will print them at 27 and aren't going to take the time to look at. Um, the real story of our schools. We're recognizing that you know PBEC is up there because that's predominantly college-bound students. Um, so we would expect them to score significantly higher um, than a comprehensive school that also has kids who are in career paths. And maybe even if you know, did I understand right that there's benchmarks now for what is career ready versus what's college ready, and it's two different things. Um, or is it the same benchmark? Yeah, it's the same benchmark. Okay. And, but they're saying that that benchmark is an indicator of both career readiness and college okay. readiness. Because um, if you think about it, a college-bound student is going to have a lot more education, but a career-bound student, this is, we've got to make sure they've got what right. I need, um, because this is it. Because it would be helpful to know where that is at some point, but I know they're still developing that. Okay, thank well, you. Kind of I just wanted to say that you guys have done a great job on focusing on the primary literacy and I'm really looking forward to seeing that same focus that we're starting to do now in math and seeing what that does to our scores because that that focus that we have been working on made a difference for our students so I'm truly um, hoping they did the same for our math scores and then in a couple of years from now we're right here celebrating both score so thanks for all the hard work and and doing all that and i look forward to seeing where you guys go with that we have a lot of exciting things up our sleeves for now mm -hmm. questions or comments okay thank you very much so now we're on to our professional development performance update Thank you, Kathleen. That was an excellent job. I have a new appreciation for Vertigo. Right now, my head is spinning around. Uh, you did an excellent job. It makes sense of, of a lot of great information. That's important. We have metrics and measure change. That's uh, that's essentially true in the position I'm in as well. One of, one of the most important studies in the last two years in professional development is called the Mirage Report. It was released in 2015. 
it's one of the most cited uh, to education professional development out there right now. And essentially, what it what it did is it looked at four big, uh, large school districts across the country, and it, it took a look at professional development, and then it, it sort of took a look at um, so that's the input, and then uh, it sort of took a look at the output. So, so it puts effort, resources, time, money, energy, focus, and what are we getting out in return? What was interesting in that study is the four schools that they chose the average professional development uh, resources in terms of money or dollars put in was $18,000 per teacher per year. Well, we can all relax because in District 49, we don't even come within 10% of that amount. Uh, I kind of took a look at what we do, what we put in uh, last spring after kind of reading that, there's about 7 or 8% of that amount. Uh, but the interesting thing was they, they found out that putting more and more and more money in didn't change the positive results of what was coming out. It wasn't a matter of pour more in, it was about do more with what you have. And that's, that's, sort, of been, that's sort of been our mission uh, with professional development. And so, uh, thank you, uh, school board, for allowing me time to share my passion, which is to uh, do what I can to help make this the best choice uh, in the region. And that's certainly uh, our mission in professional learning is to make, um, you know, provide those opportunities for our teachers so that, that the choices we give them are also the best choice available. And so, I'm Brian Green. I'm the coordinator for professional learning. And I'm going to share with you sort of how last year went and what what the future looks like uh, moving forward. And so this year marks the fifth, uh, we're entering the fifth year of the AHA Network. And AHA Network um, is the, it's the professional development gateway for not only our educators, but folks in the Pikes Peak region to access professional development opportunities. Uh, I brought you all a gift. Okay. This is an AHA Network pen to commemorate the special agreement. Thank you. Thank you. AHA Network. Aha. Now the light goes on. <laughs> just just see the light bulbs light up. And so you, you can see our vision is to be a best choice for professional learning, which aligns with the vision of the district. And our mission is to provide innovative, engaging professional learning that empowers educators to accelerate student learning. And so part of the AHA network is, uh, this was added a year ago, of course, catalog. And I'm proud to say that uh, it is it is a you know robust portfolio of offerings and opportunities for uh, educators across the district to choose from in all modalities, all different forms. And uh, part of our innovation uh, is is one provide better access, which this does, but also provide uh, unique or innovative getting training or uh, growing as a professional. And I'll, I'll share more of that later. But you can see here, um, there are about 12 catalog choices here. We have our AHA. We start with an AHA, and that's part of our online learning on demand set of choices. But we offer the traditional uh, opportunities as well, the workshops, face-to-face, -face, the in-service opportunities, uh, bringing speakers in, uh, doing all those kind of things, blended. Uh, uh, all those kind of uh, opportunities. And so this is a look at um, sort of, are we getting customers to, to put eyes on our network? And so we started measuring that a year ago in 2015-16, that 152,000 uh, people go to our network to look at professional learning. Last year, we had 179,000. Kind of put that in perspective, 
Uh, if we have about a thousand teachers, now leaders are looking at this, people in the community might be getting on here as well. But if we just kind of look at it through that frame, we have approximately a thousand teachers, then those thousand teachers are looking uh, at the AHA network about every other day. So the frequency is pretty high, and, and so we, we feel uh, really good about we're getting the customers, if you will, in this sense, uh, looking at our product uh, and, and engaging them in, in selecting some opportunities. This one takes a look at, at our learning on demand. Last year, we presented a brand new concept, pretty innovative across the country, really, is to provide professional development that was uh, high quality, that, that was um, you know, focused on, on certain goals and initiatives and topics and that kind of thing. Uh, but that we're learning on demand so that we kind of met the educator where they had time and interest. We kind of put them a little more at the center of learning. Uh, and so as a result, our AHA network courses, we call those key courses. These are 15-hour courses. They're instructor-led. A teacher can decide to get a leader or an educator or even a community member can get in these courses today, tomorrow, in October, in November. They can finish them slowly, quickly, uh, but we engage them with an online instructor, and uh, we had 199 people take advantage of that last year. And then our SPARK courses are a little different. Those are also learning on demand, they're five hour, and they're intended to uh, you know, sort of inspire teachers to rethink certain concepts that they you know, they, they know about, but maybe they need uh, a little picking up you know, passion for teaching or engaging students and that, that kind of And so when we brought in uh, our new registration system a year ago, or two years ago rather, uh, what, what we do at the end of each course is we ask them to take a five question survey. And so that helps uh, inform us on some things that we can do better uh, or change. And so some of it is, is quantitative nature and some of it is more um, you know, qualitative where they give, uh, give feedback in that format. And so the first year we, we ran the surveys, we had about 1,000 in, in the participant pool that responded to the survey. And uh, then our mostly met, completely met group was uh, represented about 87%. This past year, we had over uh, 4,500 people take the survey. And our um, mostly met, completely met went from 87 to 88%. I know that's only a 1% movement of the needle, but it is times almost 400 times more people in the sampling. So now we're going to look at um, the idea of kind of offering those opportunities. So this is looking at three different years and the number of courses that we sponsored or uh, we, we kept record of that were in our registration system. You can see it's a pretty steep growth. Last year, we wanted to sort of set a target just to have something to measure uh, growth against or to, to really focus the conversation. Hey, what do we need to do to grow this much, to increase, increase the number of offerings, that kind of thing. And so the, the dot in the line represents what our target was for uh, the end of this year, uh, June 30th, and you can see and that was a 10% mark. We wanted to improve at least 10%, and we went far beyond that. So that's providing opportunities and offerings. And then this is a similar graph, and what it's measuring is it's measuring participation. So if we're, if we're offering opportunities, and we have a sort of a storefront to take advantage of this, are people using it? And the answer is uh, definitely yes. So once again, you can see the dot line, that was our 10% uh, increase goal, and of course, uh, we shot way beyond that. I guess the challenge uh, in moving forward is to try to keep that kind of growth going. Uh, so, uh, yeah, pretty excited about that. And so, this, this is really a screenshot of a model classroom page. This project's been going on, it's, it's also entering its fifth year. The idea is a lot of times we can't uh, get teachers out of the classroom to go watch other teachers teach, which is a very powerful way to learn. 
um, for professional learning. Uh, but what we can do maybe is go capture teachers doing those great things and then bring it in a format available uh, so the teachers can learn from others. So that's the model classroom. And this year we're building, we have a couple classes built around these model classroom videos. One is a um, sort of a, uh, a scenario based study where you're a first year teacher, or you're a fifth year teacher, or you're a veteran teacher, and you're experiencing this and that and the other thing. Here's what these teachers do. And then inspire them, to kind of learn from each other, and then go try it. Now, I'll move quickly here. Uh, so, here are the views. So, we're, we're seeing more traffic get to our model classroom, which is encouraging. Uh, people are choosing to uh, learn from others in District 49. Mo moving forward, Lens is all about being innovative. Working together across the zone, forming partnerships and teamwork, uh, and try to help support initiatives going on there, and then just continue to provide uh, quality opportunity. So one of the things we're doing that's innovative is uh, peer-driven professional development. We're pretty excited about this. It, it's unique. It might be the only one going on around the country right now. The idea is to provide a framework where uh, small cohorts of about seven to ten teachers can come together, coalesce around uh, some idea that they're interested in. Uh, maybe it's engagement, maybe it's classroom management, maybe it's, it's, maybe it's curriculum focus, and turn them into sort of uh, mini teacher researchers, have them kind of set their learning outcomes, come up with their timeline, go do the research, share what they find, pick one or two strategies, take it to the classroom, be intentional with observation, make records, share what they've learned, kind of produce a format to share with the larger community, place it on AHA Network, and it's just a real unique model. And so we're rolling that out initially with all of our inductees. The idea is that we're going to start them off uh, by pre-selecting a topic of, of classroom management and have them focus on that for this first quarter and be that kind of, kind of have that teacher researcher mindset and learn from each other. And also putting putting those inductees sort of in contact with each other so they have you know peers that they can they can talk to in a little different environment, a little different space. And then the teacher induction program is one of our uh, that's one of our big events at the start of each year where we bring all of our new teachers in and it's a, it's a big one day conference event um, in orientation kind of spreads out over three days but we get them that first day and really make that a special uh, special event. You can see there, uh, we have a little over 140 participants this year. And uh, in our induction program, this is a five year induction review cycle for us. And so uh, we're looking at our induction program. Of course, every year we're trying to make it better, but um, we see our numbers have grown with that as well. Uh, we also provide leadership development. You can see some of those things that we do. Uh, something that is new in July, which I'm really excited to share with you, is, is called Leadership Launch. And the idea was to provide sort of conference style opportunities for uh, our leader building level leaders to to get to maybe 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 they just need a refresher on how something worked or school law or something like that and uh, that was a two-day morning only kind of conference style what was interesting about that is uh, with the feedback we got from the leaders 100 uh, percent you know you, you don't know going in what those results are going to be but 100 percent said, hey, this, this is something we'd like to have an effort again next year. And then the whole idea of this teamwork is, uh, you know, it's real interesting because every, every zone in school, they have their own uh, sort of different focuses and things. And so I come in and try to help lead their initiative uh, with professional development training and opportunities and bring in uh, models, frameworks, and theories and things like that to help make that work. And then finally, some testimonials from Basecamp, which is our uh, new teacher orientation, that's titled Basecamp. Uh, it's where our new teachers get their start. It's where we launch them. Leadership launch, SPARC, and our key courses. Thank you very much. Any questions? I don't have any questions, but I wanted to thank you for coming to the student board meeting and talking to them. They they appreciated being asked questions and how they felt about Toology and all that. So that was really nice for them to have that input with you and taking the time to engage them. That was great. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank, thank you. I appreciate you saying that. So for those that don't know, um, so we wanted we wanted to kind of understand uh, student perspective on on uh, you know e-learning. So it was it was a fun uh, attempt to get out there and, and kind of pick their brains a little bit. What what works for them and how they see e-learning and that kind of thing. So thank you. Anyone else? I want to thank you because I know you've been the, the primary driver of growing this um, from Amber's inception of it and to see the level um, that it's grown to over the, the past several years is pretty amazing. And you can see that it's needed and wanted and um, to have useful professional development for our staff rather than just checking off the boxes so you can send in your certification paperwork every five years is awesome and i love how it's helping our staff recognize this, the strengths they have in themselves because many of these things are things our staff put together is something they learned that they were really good at so then they share it with others and having this way to share it is amazing so thank you i know we only have you for this year um, and then you're going to join your wife on retirement who left us this summer and so I don't know how many more times we'll be able to see you, so I want to make sure I really say thank you because this is this is impacting everyone who works for our kids. And I know it's just not the teachers and the academic folks that are using it anymore. Our trainings are expanding to people in all areas in our district, and and that's because of your vision. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. I'm, I'm humbled and honored, and my heart will always be in District 49. And I'm just so proud of, of where, where we are today and where we're heading tomorrow. So thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So then now we're on to a new job description. I think this one will be real quick. Good evening, I'm Kayla Martinez, District 49 Kids Corner Program Manager. Um, wanted to come before you this evening and give you a little bit of kind of what's going on in our program as we've expanded. Um, in 2014, we expanded, we were just in the Sand Creek Zone and we were the before and after school program in the Sand Creek Zone. And over the summer, we expanded into the Falcon and the Power Zones. Um, and so we now have nine programs running, um, before and after school programs, and then we also have three summer camps or fall break or spring break, Christmas break programming running. Um, and so with that um, comes more staffing needs. And so we have, um, we'd like, we're proposing that we create a new job description that is a very entry level position. Um, in which somebody who doesn't quite have lots of experience or the um, certified experience that the state requires can come in and work with our students. Um, this opens up the ability to have um, our high school students come in and work for a couple of hours and gain experience working with children in an education setting. Um, so, by state mandated regulations, we have to have a 1 to 15 ratio, one adult per 15 students. And currently we do that with a site lead and a site assistant. Our site assistants must have three months verifiable experience working with children. And that can limit people a lot because people who have mandating experience aren't qualified because it's not verifiable. And so, we really need to kind of open up our pools um, to accept applicants who may not have that verifiable experience, but do have some experience working with children. Um, so we would like to, we're asking that this is moved to a decision at the next board meeting, um, but I'm here to answer any questions that you might have. So is, the, is there a requirement that they be 18 to have this position or not? No. Okay. Because we said, that's, yeah, that's interesting. Because we do have a child development pathway over at Vista, so this would be a really nice time um, for some of those opportunities. So I'm excited that you're thinking through it this way and, and thinking.
because we have kids who are interested in this pathway and what a great way to figure out if it's a fit for you too. Exactly. That's the best experience that you know if the classroom is the place for you is giving experience in the classroom. Okay. Any questions? No. Okay, are we good moving it forward? Yes. yes. Okay, here's how it gets this Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now we have policy update. Good evening, Paul Anderson, Director of Human Resources. The draft changes that you see are um, to, the, to these two policies are um, to really to carry out what um, you what was presented to you back in June, and those were recommendations from the Teacher Compensation Task Force. The task force um, worked on, on a number of things. One of their really key objective was to work on ideas related to the use of 3B funds. Um, this happens to not be, this, this happens to be another idea uh, that, that, that the, the task force developed and spent some time talking about that is, is not, doesn't have a 3B impact, it's not funded by it. Um, but it's a, it's a request to, their, their idea is to, as a retention um, initiative, uh, increase the number and mix of, of sick and personal days that uh, that are allotted to staff as, uh, the longer that they stay. So the, the, this uh, the, the revisions that are, are drafted here to GB, GG, uh, I think sh should accomplish uh, what, what that recommendation uh, is. So I'll start with whether there are questions about uh, the, this, these, the changes that we've incorporated into here. Anyone have any questions on the changes? Okay. I'm seeing no. Kevin, I can't see you. Anything? Yes. Okay. So they're good on the changes piece. Then, did you have another piece? Uh, so what I want to point out is that so your your um moving the policy forward and then and then approving these changes makes it possible for us to do this. There's other work that we're still um, sorting out and planning in terms of the implementation and make, making this happen from the system's perspective. So just know that we are not ready to go, but we will be, um, but, but uh, members of the business office team are figuring it all out and, um, and our hope will be to be ready to implement it as soon as possible. Does this increase the amount of the total sick and personal days that they would have had in the past under the separate policies. Yeah, yeah. so if, if you look at, in fact, if you look at the table that, uh, where, it talk, where it refers to at higher, the at higher column, um, that's, that's what a person receives today and it stays that uh, throughout their employment. Um, so uh, it, it'll increase, and what, what I'm doing, what one of the changes that we're making here is pulling uh, the personal leave section out of the other staff leaves policy and moving it into the sick and personal because we're starting to talk about these two together now. So, so you're basically combining both to account for paid time off uh, under one policy instead of two separate policies. Adding a day, you know, uh, it's a mix of days. But basically, adding an additional day at five years, an additional day at ten years, an additional day at fifteen years. Right. So really, after fifteen years, there's only three additional days that they would get under the new policy. Whereas under the old policy, it stayed the same at twelve. That's correct. Yeah, gotcha. at ten and two. And uh, yeah, and I think the, the other significant part of this is for it's not just the, the total number of days, but the, the, but the mix. And what what is significant about that is that. Um, uh, sick has been has been um, we've been very, we've very strict. Thank you Good work for this. Um, uh, in terms of the use of sick, and we and so um, when we say you get ten sick days, but you can only use it for sick for if you are sick or a family member is sick to care for them. So it's been that that part of it uh, has been difficult for a teacher uh, when they have the, these two personal days to use at their discretion with appropriate notice. Um, 
so this changing in the mix uh, does a lot for staff in terms of having more flexibility to take care of, of, of uh, other matters in their life. And, and, and just as a reminder, they don't, they don't receive any form of vacation leave, so this, these days are probably what they have available. I think that's important to note. You know, I would, I think industry is moving more towards what they call paid time off, which is, you know, here are the parameters, use it how you need it, whether it's sick, personal, take care of the kid, take someone to the doctors, take someone to the DMV. So, you know, it's just, a, that's what I'm used to. I think that's what it is. Well, it's, it's still a combination because education is unique um, when it has classroom impact. And so, you know, if you, the classroom, that's why sick time is so strict, is because of how it impacts the kids in the classroom when we're out, and because if a teacher's out, they have to pay someone to be there for the kids. So it's not just, there has to still be someone there. We're in many jobs, you're sick, and your work just piles up on your desk later for you to do. Um, so, but as the district got stricter, it got harder and harder for folks who both live and work for us in those situations. Because if your child attends a school here and you work here, everybody knows why you turned that sick day in. It's because your kid had a field trip and you wanted to be there. And so, and that used to kind of be loosely okay at some level. And that has shifted, and as that shifted, people didn't have that flexibility unless. They chose to live in one place and work in another. And so we were hearing a lot of angst over that um, from people who are both parents and teachers about how to, how to have that life balance for them too. And this allows more of that by allowing them to be honest and take a personal day um, when they're doing something that is not sick. And so and we've required that honesty because we've asked for documentation on sick days and said, this is what you need to do. Um, and so this is respecting that there are things other than someone being physically ill that can be really important for you to be a part of um, in your kid's school life and in your family's life too, and giving our employees the same opportunity that they may have if they were in a different profession. So I appreciate the balance. Was there any type of state requirement or expectation of sort of shifting or moving this, or did it directly just come from the teacher compensation task force? It's it's. Uh, I attribute this completely to the teacher compensation task force. And it's okay under state guidelines, you're fitting in with that. Yeah. Okay. Is everyone okay with moving this forward? Yes. Okay, and we'll get the cost estimate later. Are we expecting it to be significant given how little the day, actual number of days is shifting? Uh, well, it depends on your definition of significance. Uh, we're in the process of, of uh, sorting that out. It, um, we're, 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 beginning to start with what is the number of days of initial impact. So if all of a sudden the people with five years, 10 years, or more have these additional days, the question is how many more sub days are we likely to, to incur? If this is, if we can, I think we can expect that the days are, that are available as personal leave will be taken um, and versus being saved and rolled over to sick leave. So we are, beginning, I think we are saying we're going to plan on people becoming up more um, and, and Potentially, uh, and maybe that it may offset with sick leave and people will use less sick because they've got those days and they feel appreciated. And, and, uh, but in any case, uh, there is some number of days, and, I, and we can provide that calculation of times 90, whatever number of days times $90 a day for that substitute. Um, and so it's a very helpful number. And yes. So are these days cumulative over the years? <clears throat> and do they pay out when someone retires? Okay, so the uh, personal days are do not uh, accumulate or accrue past the the uh, end of the fiscal year, so June period. If and any unused um, personal days roll over to sick leave. Sick leave can be paid out at retirement, um, and that's there's two different. They either have to be the, the retire having 15 or more years of service with District 49, or eligibility to retire under para with at least five years of service. And, uh, at that point, those days, their bills will be paid out at um, the substitute rate to pay for that position. Okay, so if I heard you correctly, I'm just gonna paraphrase so I understand it. Personal days do not roll over year to year, but if 
if I have any day personal days left over, it converts to sick days, which do roll over. Correct. So in of essence, it's they they do accumulate, but it's sick days. But sick days do cats to yeah. to what? Well, have one hundred twenty days. Is the, is so the cat yeah. So it doesn't just so if you're, you're one hundred thirty days at the end of mm -hmm. that fiscal year, you lose ten. Uh, actually, I think that's right. It, it, yeah, it pays off at half the substitute rate, I think, at the end if you haven't taken your 100. Yeah. If you're at 130, I think those 10 days, you get five days of sub pay for, basically, because it pays off at half the rate, if I read it right. Maybe I'm remembering, maybe I'm remembering something that was crossed out, yeah. but I thought that So was, an employee shall be paid at a rate of one half the substitute rate for that position for each day of unused sick leave. Accumulated over 120 days, and that's an annual exercise. Yeah, so that and that's not new. Right. Okay. Yeah, and and that's <laughs> smart fiscal planning because otherwise you're encouraging people to get sick for 10 days, essentially because they're going to lose them anyway. Um, and so they'll be the person who for sure stays home with the kid every time instead of alternating with a spouse or whatever. And under our current benefit structure, we want to encourage people to bank to to, to accrue sick leave. Because it become, we don't provide a, 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 di a district paid short term disability benefit, so there's a 90 day period before long term disability. So we encourage people to save sick leave so that if you have that event in your life, uh, that, that you're covered, you got that bridge to long term disability. Although people can, it, does, it sounds more draconian than it is because you can choose to participate in a sick leave pool that helps cover you during that time by choosing to donate a couple of your own sick days to the pool that someone who has a catastrophic event can apply to if they don't have enough to cover their illness. I know that from personal experience. So, um, and it's you know a very nice extra benefit for those people in the first 10 years who might not be able to save. Um, you know, who don't have, who can't save 120 days because they don't have enough time in the district. There is a method for them to still help each other, protect each other from it. Going off what John said, and at the same time as you're formulating it, would it be okay to call it uh, pay time off? Would we use that vernacular? Um, there, there actually are, I, so I'm not an expert on this, but I, there are distinctions between actual PTO policies, and, and my understanding is that a, a, P, a PTO benefit becomes, uh, an employee owns it once it's earned. Um, and in this case, our employees don't own it, and we don't really own it until we use it. Um, so, from a financial exposure perspective, or you know, cost to cost to the organization, I mean, that's that's the key difference, as I understand it. So, great thing. Well, and being able to control that distinction between sick and personal, because of the unique role you play if you're in a classroom, it just is a it, it's a fact of life of of working in education is. We have to try and plan many of those personal things around some of the things that some of the times that are built into the calendar, um, and then that's why we have limited, limited personal, which would be kind of more of a traditional paid time off too. Okay, thank you. I think we're all good with moving that. Okay, and now we have Donna, the preamble to board policy piece. So my question is whether or not you want to revise this preamble and keep it as um, a section before the policy manual or repeal it, which is sort of what CASB recommends because, because the, um, the days of having paper manuals everywhere is, uh, you know, they're all online now. So. I'm looking for some direction. I when um, when I looked at this, there was no date as to when it was adopted. Um, I, I went by the you know the original date that I found, but um, it hasn't been looked at or updated in quite some time. So I thought it was time to have a discussion about it. 
Personally, I'm okay with removing it because if the only purpose is that it was the front page of the book when you handed a person a book of policies, no one even looks, no one would be, I, it'd be interesting to see how many times anyone has even accessed that document because now they're going to do a keyword search and find the policy directly they're interested in rather than reading a general statement about why we have policies, I think. Other opinions? Or comments? Because we need to come up with a direction. So we need to either say, yes, we would like to repeal it, or no, we'd like to keep it. Yes, I would like to repeal it. OK, I need a consensus. Other folks chime in, please. All right, we got at least three of us saying, take it out. All right, yeah. yeah. And we have a tape, so it'd be really great if you guys spoke and like talked into it so people know it's not just me making that decision. Um, okay, so now we are on to the monthly financial report with um, Mr. Ridgeway and Ms. Pullen. Am I saying her name correct? <laughs> That's why we're a good balance, right? Hello, good evening. I'm Jody Bullen. I'm the new accounting group manager for Mr. 49. Um, Brett, then you want to come up and, and join me and hold my hand while I do this first time? So. I have to do this one. I'm there. good. <laughs> Um, and so um, this month's financial report um, for June 30th, um, we're, it, it is unaudited. Um, we're still working on doing some final touches um, for the audit. Um, but a couple, um, sorry, a couple pages that I wanted to focus on um, with you is on um, roughly page, on the bottom it says page four, um, five, six, and seven. Um, and just going a little, little bit over um, the general fund. Um, at 630 um, on um, this page on page four right now is basically a general fund for um, the revenues which I just wanted to point out are 99.7% um, of what we budgeted so um, right in there with a window of precise performance which we strive to be at um, and then if we go to the next page um, the same thing with the expenses um, right at 98.9% of um, budgeted expenses um, for the year, which is um, fantastic. Um, I, the, um, the next page um, kind of shows a, I like it because it's a little bit less, it's all the same information, just a little bit more condensed for you, um, showing your revenues and expenses in the same um, area. And I will, even though there is, um, we're digging into the fund balance a little bit um, because of the high connect um, restructuring um, that we did, um, we don't have to dig in so deep. Um, you can see it's about 2.6 million was um, in the amended budget, but we're only at about um, just over 1.7 million. Um, so um, let's draw it. Let's draw down the fund balance. Remember that the amended budget had that. We assume draw down the fund balance of that two two and a half million dollars. And coming in less than that. So I, I think that's kind of great. Obviously, I was been here for a month back, so I can't really take credit for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it's definitely um, team effort. Yeah, it's been it's been great. Um, you know, getting to know. Um, I worked a nonprofit before this, so it's similar. Um, but getting to know some of those um, details and digging in um, has been great these past few months, and I appreciate all the help from everybody. With them asking um, different questions to understand things, really understand how the 49 um, works. Um, and then the other page is for those of you who like pictures, don't like reading numbers, um, there's some graphs, and it just is telling you um, basically um, the expenses and revenues in graph form, picture form for you. If you have any questions, I certainly will try to answer them. And I have made a first breath. Um, but so I will try my best. You get a couple of those things that, that should, you know, reiterate things that we've talked about before on these graphs. You know, uh, 
84% of our revenue being state source and only 16% being local. Again, that being part of the problem we've talked about in terms of the Gallagher Amendment and creating this imbalance between local share and state share on that top graph. Uh, and then the bottom graph, uh, you know, validating what we already know very well that it's all about the personnel, you know, 81% uh, of it being salaries and benefits. So. Okay, so is the reason federal revenue is zero there is because federal revenue ends up in other funds and not in general fund because it's for specific programs? It's because federal revenue in the general fund is, yeah, is, there is general, there is federal revenue in the general fund. It's just so immaterial that it averages to zero. We have, the federal impact aid is the only significant revenue source we have, and it's, it's about a few hundred thousand dollars on a hundred million dollar budget. Um, but yes, other things like the Title I pro the Title programs, those are all accounted for in uh, the grants fund. Okay, because it's if we looked at total revenue, it's something more like seven or eight percent, right? I remember just from when we had the special education conversations with the marijuana stuff. Yeah, but it was around seven and a half or eight million dollars that was in federal play. Right. Right. Okay. And the uh, property taxes does that come through a state revenue or local? That's local and so property taxes. And no, uh, no rise or local as well. That is, and, but that would be a different fund, not in fund 10. This is the fund 10. Gotcha. That's that base 45 mills or whatever I think that's on our taxes. Is that 16%? So the 45 is, is more of the total that includes oh. the MLO. So okay. it's, it's, I think like 24, 25 is the base. Okay. Um, that's part of this. Anything else you want to point out to us tonight? Yeah. Anyone have any further questions? A quick question in regards to the MLO Oversight Committee. Is that different than the DAC MLO Subcommittee, Budget Subcommittee? Uh, and does that work? How does that decide that? I, I was confused on that. It's just a basic understanding. But no, they, they are this one in the same. There's there's as what has been the Budget Subcommittee of the DAC, and it still is technically the Budget Subcommittee of the DAC, is also uh, taking on the oversight of the MLO. Okay, so it is the same group. It, it was just terminology that sort of confused me. I didn't know if it was yeah. a separate group. I understand, yeah, it's the same group. I just wanted to say thank you. Great job for your perspective. Thank you. 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 Okay, so now we are on to the enrollment update. The numbers we're all curious about this year. So you're advancing to 297 in your packet? Yeah, 297 is the cover shape, 298 is the first row. If you're in the revised packet. We didn't talk about the other three items. Makes me sorry I work with. Oh, there we go. Found it. Good evening, board. Uh, Ron's friend, financial manager. Um, I want to first uh, commend uh, Jody as coming on into our department. She's uh, really hit the ground running and has uh, helped out tremendously. So, uh, kudos to, to her. Um, at this time of year, it, we, you know, uh, we like to see how our student counts are coming in as to how we uh, budgeted for our proposed budget. Um, I presented this data the last uh, two or three years. Um, thought it was a little messy, a little uh, hard to read, hard to understand. So um, it's a couple more pages now, but I think it's a little easier to read. And We've added some, uh, I think, some good information. I'm going to start here uh, at the district. Um, this district slide, that's your, the, the first one there, um, and it has our budget line, which is the green, the green line uh, across there, um, shows where, how we budgeted, and then the, the the gold is is where we're sitting as far as our IC counts are. Um, I have two numbers that I I uh, reference in the graph itself. That, that look to um, the difference between where we're at and the budget, and then where we're at in this gray line here. So what, what I've done is I've taken the last two years of 
of, of data as we gathered it um, from the beginning of July and created a uh, anticipated uh, line um, on where we need to be at what point to hit our our budget line. So you can see um, at the beginning of the year we see a lot of enrollment, uh, a lot of people signing up, getting on, and then and then that's happening in other districts as well. Um, and as they start putting their people on, we start getting that information here and we start to disenroll them. And you see this trough come down here. We level out for a while and then we see that same type of hump here at the end. Um, you need to do a little more research on understanding that, um, but um, we're, we, we see uh, you know, maybe some kids coming in right before the October count, and then this big drop at the end is uh, um, when we go through our October count process, which is a very detailed process where we clean up uh, um, and make I see pretty much exactly what our attendance is. Uh, any questions on on? What the gray line represents and, and what we're tracking. So just to say again, yeah, that that gray line is two years of data, which is enough to use. It's not it's not completely predictive yet. I wouldn't say it's just providing a little bit more flavor than what we had in the past. So a good indication. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out through the, the course of, of these coming weeks through October. So um, as if, if you want to see then the individual how uh, each individual zone. Is uh, affecting this graph. You can go to the next pages. Uh, each each page where I have the zone listed up at the top. Um, the first graph is the zone itself, so that's the, the entire zone rolled up um, together. And then um, each one of those each one of those zones uh, roll up to that budget line. And then if you want to see how uh, the zone rolls up, and I have each individual school. Uh, then under that, but then each individual school's um, anticipation, how they've built their budget over the last two years, or how they how they uh, run their accounts over the last two years. This is gonna this lends to a lot of questions um, as to uh, you know why or where where are they? Um, I'm going to be adding to these slides. I don't have um, historical data. Uh, it's some, I, somewhere I'm not sure we can find it's in Ryan's uh, uh, emails, but uh, some of the, the charter information uh, from for the last few years. I know we have the current years, and I need to build these those, those models to add to this. Uh, we know uh, CMA, uh, the, the, the military academy, is, is doing fairly well, and so uh, I know there's been some uh, feelers out to see. Uh, how many of those uh, kids are potentially were were uh, employment kids from last year? Um, so. and, and I think uh, one issue that you definitely see on these pages if you go to the Allies building is is how that the issues that we've had with that building getting it physically there and up to and, and, and able to receive kids is definitely causing um, an issue there and uh, in, in there with and with. Uh, with that and with Odyssey both. So both UC Allies and Odyssey kind of below target is because we don't have the capacity that we thought we were going to have when we were starting that budget. So um, that that's kind of the, the single biggest issue I think in play right now. There's a lot, lot of other stuff you see going back and forth. Uh, you know, TPEC's still not building as quick as we like it to build. Um, some things like that. Woodman Hills isn't getting as much overflow as maybe they might have expected in terms of overflow capacity. So. In part because of Woodman Hills, we had a critical mass enough to add a section at Meridian that we hadn't projected. So that shows positively. It doesn't. It's neutral in terms of the zone, but it shows Meridian as a little higher than expected and Woodman a little lower than expected. And so I got to say, respectfully, this is the best graphic representation I've seen of this kind of data since I've been here. I think this is wonderful leadership from Ron. And it is helping the education office do a much better job of not over responding to adjustments and variances and trusting that this build is normal and it's gonna it's gonna come in or not. It's just really good information. It's really helping us in the education office at the zone level and the building level make better decisions. Right, thank you. Yeah, you bet. Uh, one of the things I, I believe we're gonna see is uh, we're gonna see this this not be so drastic here. I, I think um, I've been just been personally hearing um, that that we're seeing a lot more uh, 
I don't know if you call it cleanup, but uh, some cleanup of, of IC. And so my guess is we're going to see that kind of level out and maybe have a little hump here at the end, but not as dramatic as, as we have seen in the past. Any questions? I have a question about the allies. Mm -hmm. um, are you saying that there isn't room to add the 65 extra that were projected, or people just aren't coming? There's there's actual room in the building for them, but they just didn't sign up. I'm saying the budget would have assumed that we had the separate building in place that added the capacity for the entire allies program, and then also then gave that capacity back to Odyssey. And because of the delays in getting that building in place, that is a major disconnect between the budget assumption and what we're actually experiencing. But I guess the question is, is there currently a waiting list? Was there a waiting list for allies? Or there were seats available, or we did we have seats available and not we as are. many sign up? And that can in part be because parents don't have a facility to come to. But I think that was in clarity what her question was. We're, we're turning people away. We're placing people on a wait list. If we had the facility, we'd be placing them into a seat. That was, I think, and, the and there's a marketing issue. Okay. Yeah. What about uh, class sizes? Are those concerns for over 25, 30 students per class size in Alberta? Neither the district nor the state sets guidelines for class size. And so in District 49, our history has been to let those essentially float at the zone level. And zones have different historical um, orders for where they would split a class or add a paraprofessional. Uh, I'll give you one example. If you look at, um, can you show the Vista Ridge High School graph right now? Vista Ridge was building in substantially higher that build or projection, the middle chart there, they were holding above 1600 for the first three of the first four weeks, I believe. Now I've seen the I've seen the intermediate graph. This this packet came out prior to the, the data that came out two days ago. Vista Ridge dropped 70 students, 78 students in, in one week's period of time. So right now, when I've got a kid in one of them, there are classes that are overcrowded there. But by not overreacting to that surge, Vista intelligently didn't overstaff or give teachers overload contracts because when Vista's right on the power's boundary, when the other school districts open their doors, Vista has a drop off. We know that uh, we, we, we expect to see a fade. That's been more dramatic than our historical build, but we expected some fade. And so, we really have to wait and see where things shake out in the middle of September before we make our final adjustments. Um, typically, we have very few classes that are that are out of our range, uh, and that that range varies depending on the subject and depending on the zone of the school. Any other questions? Okay. Um, you mentioned about following You mentioned. Mentioned about charter schools. Yeah, yeah. is that something we either need to report or can we see here? How's that work? Um, that we, we have a couple, we can see a couple of the schools in IC, but the bulk of them we get an email report from the, the school. That's what we've been doing this year to start gathering the data. Is that something we would be able to see, or is that something that affects us? I mean, I'm kind of feeling like we're picking on the public schools, and I'm more curious to see. Uh, it's more just an information for us just to. To know, um, are they seeing something similar to us, um, or are they going up? Yeah, um, or or is the public shifting over to charter? Exactly. Too. I, I, that's more and important. That's that's important. Coordinated. How that works. It's coordinated and charter because they're both public. Sorry. Okay. So. But in terms of you know, he Ron mentioned the CMA earlier, and you know, and being able to really understand that is not something we really get to get to know until after the fact, until after October Council, yeah. and we get to see data from other districts and, and know where choice enrollment has shifted and things like that. So that's not something we can kind of measure as it's happening. We have to kind of wait and see what it is, what did the end result tell us. Got it. Thanks for the mistake. Any other questions? No, thank you very much. Thank you guys. Have a wonderful evening.
Okay, so next is establishing and revising job descriptions for the business office leadership team. So, Frederick right, Dwight, Chief Business Officer, I want you to have you. There's, there are no new positions on this. There are some uh, some job descriptions where there are uh, a couple of tweak adjustments, if you will. Uh, and there are some that uh, some of the key individuals serving these roles have been there for quite some time and we really just needed to write, write it from scratch. Uh, so, do you, would you like me to go through them or do you want, do you want me to just throw, throw questions out to me or what's your preference? I want to know who came up with the acronym. Which acronym? Bolt. Bolt. It was you, uh, was it? Was it me? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Like your well, our education, we all like our academics. I think it's a good positive step when you, when somebody has been in a position for a while to review their job description. So, yeah, and as I went through, doing that. I'm sorry, and as I went through the annual reviews this this summer, yeah, that was that was an intentional ad. Yeah, yeah, because we did a cultural compass of, you know, orientation form, which is similar to 360, but not quite. Then there's the actual review form. And then saying, okay, yes, let's talk about the description for this position. And so that kind of allowed us to, to uh, that was an add to this year's cycle uh, that allowed us to get to, to identify all these all these things here. And some of them, like we the business office channels position, you know, you remember we started that a year ago when we knew that we we had an idea of how it was going to go, but we needed, we really needed to see how it played for a while before we had, had a better idea of how to write that job description. So like that that one's in here, and, and that's kind of the result of that year. Uh, uh, now knowing how how it's working and the benefit of that of that position to the office. So again, no new positions, no one's really changing. It's just you know getting a lot of good clarity and cleanup uh, for for folks. I'm fine with them. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, so in closing, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now we're on to um, the prioritization of facilities improvement policies. Why are you saying that? More spreadsheets. So this is circling back on the discussions we've had through the uh, a couple of meetings this summer about. Uh, Capital priorities, how we make decisions. Uh, we, we have we had a big process flow that we reviewed in the last meeting. Uh, in July, we were talking about a, a an opportunity that was being presented to us for fees of land and money that would come from that. And so, if you recall, in that in that presentation, I had a graph on a single page, which which is I actually just embedded that here into the, into the regulation section to say, here are the kind of the eight categories of how we are looking at capital needs, and then also then putting the context of what are the funding sources that those priorities can be addressed with. So that, uh, because it provides additional flavors to how things may, you know, will, would be decided and pursued. Because uh, it's not just always a, a simple question of, um, of where it ranks in, in, in this simple vertical one. Uh, if you go back to, the, we started the policy level, the FBC policy, um, and I know when changing so much, the red line is really messy to read, but basically what we had before was four categories of uh, capital needs, and we expanded it to this eight that we, that we talked about in July. And so that's what the policy is basically doing, is just establishing those eight, eight categories, and then the regulation is taking those eight categories, adding the context of funding sources, and then explaining uh, each of those categories with a little bit more detail, right? Some deep, some in some cases some more detail, and in some cases some less detail because some of the original language was a little bit too prescriptive sometimes. And so we're just trying to strike, strike a, a good balance of where we're at today. It's been quite a while since we've gone through this, and so this is all uh, a good, very timely uh, read, write, um, informed of kind of how we're operating now. And that's why the regulation basically is is a, is a strike below. If you're talking political terms, where we, we took the current regulation and said let's let's just start over and write something new. So what you'll have here is a, the new regulation on top, the original regulation all struck out um, in the later pages. So I, I have 
one question just because we get hit with this perpetually every year um, because we know we have an aging fleet and it is um, always an issue that that we we are never in a position to catch up to where we can have a replacement plan that matches um, what is often advocated for by the folks who are most knowledgeable on, on what's happening to the buses that our kids ride in. So, and and it's because of all of those other things that annual capital goes to and those things. Is there a reason why we would not, at least until we were in a position where we had played catch up, include that as a possibility in view of blue land scenarios? You might even say that priority six is really part of priority three. I'm sorry, you're probably on that one. Issues of safety and fundamental equipment for students, oh, staff, parents, okay. and constituents. I, yeah. okay. um, I, had, I hadn't considered that as a being a little land. Um, I think it's something to ponder. Well, I'm at, it's yeah. an interesting idea. Just um, because, and I'm not saying as a permanent solution, but as a recognizing that we are way behind what a recommended cycle would be and that kind of the goal of this policy was to help not necessarily in some of the conversations we're currently having about two parcels but in contemplating that there may be future opportunity as well on additional parcels that if we have a check mark in that box it lets us realistically say that's another way to help apportion some of it as a catch-up plan does that make sense? Because I know, I mean, it says these would be the most likely, so I guess we could say technically we're not completely tied by the way this is, you know, we, we there's, there's still wiggle room, I guess, in the way it's worded. But I think we also were trying to be as, we were trying to provide clarity on what our practice would be too. And so I was wondering whether it would make sense, given that we really have very limited option you know, as we look at the charts, many other things have three or four ways to be funded, and that has two. It seems like maybe that would be another place to put the check mark. Just my so, yeah. thought, but I'd yeah. like to hear from others. Just, I would, yeah. I, I, yeah, I would definitely think about it. I guess the one thing I would say is that there's not necessarily usually a lot of money in the fee and lieu fund. This is fund 43. If you look at that, there's, there's usually less than $100,000 in there. So we're not just talking the ability to buy even a single bus out of that. There may still be opportunities periodically. Um, and this is just kind of my first reaction uh, to your question. Um, so it's not, it's not, I'm not definitely not saying no to that, but it's, it's not a, it's not a, hey, here, here's a, here's a, something that they can really solve this. It, right. It may, it may be able to kick in here and there. Right. Uh, and one, one bus at a time. So. Because my thought was just, I you know, a piece of why we asked this was because we were contemplating doing some things different. Yeah. With some of the land, so we may end up seeing periodic increases yeah, in that there's, amount. There's, there's and so, you know, if future boards decide that, you know, this is a part of how we frame the conversations about how that money is available, it may be helpful to be thinking about that need. But I'm one person, not a majority. So I agree with you. I consider it, I consider the fleet to be a safety and fundamental equipment issue, which is the priority three. So, you know, I know Nutrition Services has contributed to help them buy a bus, but, you know. <laughs> I think the only comment I'd make is under fees in lieu of, you also have FCBC, which contributes a ton more than fees and lieu of. There's a minuscule amount that comes through there dollar to our budget, but FCBC, you know, being a private group, I think they're their bylaws are pure capital, am I correct? If I remember reading the bylaws that they foundation tended to be capital related. I believe so, yes. Tammy, do you recall that? Yes, they do have restrictions on what they can use it for. So yes, I don't think a bus would be feasible. Yeah, yeah, I think the restrictions they have on it, that's a, a volunteer organization. So we have to come talk, talk them into mm -hmm. Changing their bylaws of what they are the builders, I think. Well, well, the other part of that, though, would be that I guess I'm thinking that maybe FCBC should even be a separate column because 
we quite frankly don't have control over what they choose to contribute and cover. And this policy is really guiding how we as a district set our priorities for what we want. FCBC sets its priority for what its fund is, which means maybe it doesn't come into this classification process. Do you know what I mean? Does, does yeah, that make more sense? Yeah, like maybe they should not be referred to in our policy if we're not in, because we're not in control of their funds. That's actually a donation, and that's a volunteer. They, they right. could opt out anytime, and we have no control over that. So uh, that's, I just wanted to call attention to that's really not our discretionary money to make decisions. Right. So, so that. Spent, so yeah, I could pull that off of that. Yeah. Sure. Right. That just because that isn't even yeah. I mean, I think that's more respectful of them probably even right to not have them in a chart that's saying how the district will prioritize because we don't prioritize their funds. Yeah, and fees in lieu is a, is a unreliable funding mechanism too. I, don't, I, I can't even grasp how many dollars in fees in lieu we get. Well, yeah, as I said, we typically have less than $100,000 in dollars on there, so it comes in a few thousand dollars at a time. Because uh, it's mostly for an infill project, that's usually what you have. Yeah, yes, yeah. we have had these couple scenarios recently where there's maybe some large lots, large lots available. But it's usually what 10, 10 lots or something like that, that that might come in there. So there's maybe twenty thousand dollars comes into us or something like that. But the point is a quote by a bus. So I agree that I like the suggestion of taking SCBC out of our policy because yeah. we yeah. don't control it. But I still like the option of keeping the land in there. Some check mark for that, whatever okay. that might be, but just take it. I don't have, yeah, I don't have, I, said, I, I want to think about it a little bit about it in my district, so I don't, I don't have a problem with that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and, and the only reason I was contemplating that is because I know we have other scenarios. Like, we may have opportunities for it to be larger amounts mm -hmm. over a short period of time. And so if we were going to use this to help us right. frame that conversation as a guide, then and that may be an option. Right. Priority three pertains just to infrastructure, correct? Yes. And that it's primarily because of what the I think it's separated in part not just because of priority number, but also because there's only certain things. If you look at the first four, they're all things that can be covered by MLO money, and there are subsets of things that can't be because of the way the MLO is written. So it also helps frame some conversations because sometimes if it can be covered by MLO, we're not going to use, even though it could be covered by capital and general fund, we probably won't use that to cover it, and we'll use it for the priorities that don't have the MLO option. So that's a part of helping us understand the funding flow, I think. You're charting correctly, but that was kind of what I thought maybe your intent was of the way you structured it. Yeah, no, agree. You have the safe entries, you know, would be something that's where that's where that falls in the safe entries of higher opportunity. Okay, so are we good with those two pieces of feedback to move it forward? Okay, thank you very much for working on this and helping us make sure we think through things carefully. Okay, so now we have the um, policy and procedure review. Many of these were ones we've already approved as an emergency, thanks to, you know, state stuff. Um, so I don't think there's a lot new. Do anyone have questions on anything in there maybe you can look at? So I think every single one that said revised that did not show red line was one we already did an emergency for approval on. Okay, so we'll move those forward. So we're on to the Chief Officer Reports and Cascade Training. Does everybody need just a couple of minutes while they get set up to take a break? Or anybody? I need like two or three. So we'll let you guys get set up and take a couple of minutes. Donna? Yeah. Is there any reason I can't use the Apple TV? You didn't say please. I don't want to see Cascade. Yeah, that's I have like a 
My question is Okay. Or I'm just I'm at it like I also no one says it's
It's okay with that. Thank you. Okay, Jens. Uh, so we were all elected, and now you guys were. <laughs> So I'm not, I actually logged out of me and back in as the generic board account, and hopefully you all are logged in as uh, using K Butcher or D Cruisen. Um, what you should see is something similar to what I'm about to show you. So it thinks that I'm logging in for the first time on this computer. It tracks using cookies, so that's why you're seeing the screen you're seeing. So you have no goals. As board members, we have not assigned goals to you, but you supervise people. And so here, here is what's hard about the way this system sets up. Right now, you, the Cascade system thinks that you report to Donna Richard. I should have, yeah, exactly. I should have my microphone. So, um, and, and the reason it thinks that is because an individual cannot have multiple supervisors. The system has a limitation, and so it's not possible for the chief officers to have multiple supervisors. So we created this unusual generic account called the BOE account. And after tonight, you'll be able to use that account so long as you don't happen to use it at the same time. So if Dave gets a, you know, he want, he want, one night he wants to look at it and he gets on, and then John has the same night coincidentally wants to get on, John's long on will boot Dave, of course. Okay, so we'll cascade downhill. Right. So I am logged in as that as that general login. And what you can see there is that you don't have any goals, but I'm going to show you where you would go to see how the chief officers are doing, or, or really anybody in the organization. So one of the first places you would go under the very first menu where it says Board of Education. On yours right now, it says your name, right? It displays your name. If you go to my goals, you'll get an image of, well, that's interesting. You have to search your name here, and then it brings up you and Brett and everything. At least that's how I think. That, that is a way. That is a correct way. I'm not sure why my we're all activating all that. Aren't we kicking each other out? We're no, because you're all unique individuals. You should not be stepping on each other's toes. Are you logged in right now, Donna? No. Okay, so nobody else should be logged in the way I am. I'm I just got kicked as well. You're logging in using D. Crimson? No. Okay. Okay. I can I can come walk around, but this is these are the login credentials I need you to use. Your district email is your username, and the password that I sent out earlier is the <coughs> password. I don't want to save that over data. Okay. So that otherwise I'm probably about to be kicked out or about to kick you out. Let's see which happens. And it's written on your um, agendas. The password is actually written down for you on your agendas. Thank you. Are you in there yet? Nope. I'm on the board. I'm on the board in general. So you have to do me for your. Sometimes I'm not sure. Are you a caterer? No, I'm actually a chemistry teacher. No, I'm not sure. Then kind of still on your own. Yeah, I don't know why I'm kidding. Okay. Kevin. Yeah. So just, your email is Kevin. Yeah. Butcher or just Kevin Butcher? Yeah. Kevin Butcher. Yeah. Okay. I think that's probably an issue. I think that's how he handles it. Let's try it the other way. Try it as K Butcher, and I'll bet you it'll let you right in. And that'll be fixable. The only reason we're using individual ones is so that we can call the outside table. Still not letting me go. I will attempt to correct that rapidly. Yeah, but you're not counting.
is it is it letting me in? Yeah, let me in. Okay. Oh, I yeah, sorry. Oh, good. There. You shouldn't have any goals. We we have not so goals for you. So you'll notice that the that the board login, just like your logins, doesn't show any goals in this view. I'm going to show you how to see goals in just a minute, but I wanted to start with the blank slate so you understood that's not a problem. That's actually a feature, I guess. If you go to the same menu where your name is, you'll see a set of options. The option that I'm going to select won't be meaningful to you because right now nobody reports to you individually. We report to this collective account. So if you look on this screen here, you'll see I'm going to pull down to my team. When I pull down to my team, now, all of a sudden, there's a lot of content in here. Um, it happens to show me first that you can change the order. You guys won't see this on your individual accounts, but when you start logging in using the one that I'm demonstrating, you'll have the ability to see myself, the COO, and Brett. And so you can do a real quick scan if you need to be more visual. In this case, you can see I have something that's completed in green. I have quite a few things that are beginning. I, I don't have anything right now that's behind, but I probably will within a couple of weeks. Um, scrolling down, this would be kind of your, your dashboard. And so perhaps you see a goal, Brett needs to deliver the annual budget by the 30th of June. Okay, that's his first goal. It's bright green, that tells us that he has finished it. The next one is appropriate financial performance by the end of August. So we can click into that one. These are all transparent. You can see in here, within that, there are multiple goals. If you keep clicking in, if you click into this one, you can see that it's showing that he's behind. And so maybe you'd want to ask him about that. Or maybe you'd click in and you'd say, oh, it's, it's only behind because the way Cascade schedules goals is linear, but most of our work is episodic. We do something, then we wait for a while, then we do something, and then we wait. So we'll get a surge of production that'll happen at the end of the month or at the middle of the month. And so it's not enough just to see that something is or isn't on track. You have to, you have to drill in to see what track it's on. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'll, I'll cruise in here to one that I know has some updates in it. Um, so the very last goal under my name, I know you guys can't click into this yet, We've set as a leadership goal that we want people in the education office to be presenting. We want them to lead either presenting at state conferences or national conferences. And so the goal is that that would happen six times by next June. So if you click into that the way I just did, I just single clicked on that goal, and you guys can do this as well, you'll see that I've made an update and then there's a notes field here. So you could go and you could look at that and you could say, oh, good. Um, Nikki Lester has already presented at the CACTI conference, and Michael Roth, whom you met tonight, has already presented at the CASE conference. So it's updated to show that we were on track. We've completed two out of six presentations. And you can also see, I'm going I'm to zoom the size of it so you can see it on that monitor in front of you. I've also anticipated some upcoming scheduled presentations. Lou and I have been accepted to present. Uh, Mary is moderating the panel. Brian and Melissa Riggs are presenting at Learning Forward. There'll be others that will come on here, but this, this is something you could look at, or I could show you as part of my CEO report to say this is something we've, we've determined is important and we're making progress on. 
that's about as deep as you would want to dive without having the conversation. Brett's going to have the same conversation with you and something that, that he's managing. So another, another, you know, the, like a lot of programs, there's different ways you can look at the data, right? And so if you go to this strategy button, and the first one is called plan, and that brings you to what should be a kind of a standard template for all the individual plans over here on the upper right hand corner. And so are you able to, are you able to click into this? Are you, mm -hmm. Yep. Follow me on this. Okay. Upper right hand corner, you you can bring down and select plan the various plans that we have. And there you would also find the chief business officer plan. By 200 spreadsheets every week. Yes, that is that is my goal. Okay, so this view, what, what I like this view as well. What I like about this view is that it has uh, it has our cultural priorities one and two. Sorry, how we treat each other, how we treat our work, and it has the five strategic priorities in the big box. Okay, going across here, then down below is how we will map specific goals or projects into this so when you're when, when you have typically seen the business office report and you've seen uh, slides from ron or, or paul anderson or whatever this is where you can go see this now and it's and it's right here it's called the community it's in the, under the communication priority their first goal is the business office, office delivery of the monthly report to the board of education so that report will be there yeah, so you click into this and what you will, the first, the first layer you will see is, it's basically each month's, re, each month's report. Okay. okay, so you'll see 1707, 1708, 1709, etc. Okay. You run that back pretty well. Um, it's, it's. <laughs> But the actual reports aren't in there. This they is are. just in the, no, the, the report reported. So, so, so here, let's, let's drill into the 1707 report. Because again, remember, when here in August, we're recording July, right? We're not recording August, so you're looking at last month. And so then, if you're into that, then you'll see Paul Anderson, Ron Strand, Shannon Hathaway, Jim Moore, each of their individual things. So each, they each have that goal. All is marked complete. Ron's marked complete. Shannon's is marked overdue. That and that is a, that happens to be a problem uh, of mine because I haven't approved it. So if you go, we can go to Paul's and say, if "There's something you know, I want to see. What's going on with HR?" You can go over here, and unfortunately, this is where you have to kind of memorize some things because it, it's not intuitive necessarily for an infrequent user. You have to know that you got to go over here and pick, click on this magnifying glass. And when you do that, you can get into more information on that particular goal. And here, you'll see a file attached. There's the 2017 Human Resources Report. And we can click on that. And there is those slides that Paul has prepared for you. In the past. And so this is how we will organize all this stuff you know so this is a good example of how you know, how we can start this and then in terms of our routine process thing and then it will we can also then start to apply that to things that aren't maybe aren't monthly maybe they're semi-annually maybe they're just annually type of type of things so they become more goal and less routine oriented but this this program that's why that's why um i, I like what we're seeing here because we see enough we, we have enough success that we see, yes, this will work. We just have to keep investing the effort and the time in it to get there. Okay. Um, you can always use the back arrows on your browser to get back to where you were on it. So we're happy. We're, we're done with seeing all <coughs> down to any of the others. Um, like, so if you look, if you see Jim Roars here, it says manager pending. So this, this is an example where I need to go in 
and approve his report. He's, he's probably submitted his report and you'll see it, it is, it is here, but it's, it's showing 0% complete because I need to go and approve that it was done. Which is through a different window or it yeah. is here? Yeah. Okay. And, that's, and it's a different, and it's a different ID. Okay. He'd have to be logged in as Brett to approve something. Yeah, right. That is the system. I understand. Yeah. So I, pur I purposely left this un unapproved today so I could kind of show you. Right. Here's 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 what kind of is happening. Here's another example. You what you just saw mm -hmm. in what could have seen in Jen's and you saw in Paul's case was a PDF file. Tonight, Kathleen Grandis recognized that you needed to see that PowerPoint with a state average line, so she could go in. She could do the PowerPoint for you again, and she probably is going to want to. She could record her voiceover, and instead of uploading a PDF file, she could upload the PowerPoint file so that you could go back and see version two as a PowerPoint instead of just as a static PDF. And then her build that she was she was that she had developed, oh, yeah. then that would work in PowerPoint in a way it couldn't work in PDF. So the ability to upload files is a um, is a part of this that I think is gonna is gonna make your agenda more human because we can present things to you. Your packet, your packet, what do you mean? Your packet, what yeah. did I say? It's agenda. agenda. Yeah, yeah. But there will be parts of your agenda, your packet, that you could go watch the PowerPoint and listen to it ahead of time it, instead of having to hear it for the first time live. So we think there's a lot of potential here. Yes. And, and the key is I'm going to leave your individual accounts enabled for a while. I'll say maybe a couple of weeks. It, if you get in and just dig around and play around, it's not intuitive, but it is figure outable. You can recognize the patterns. Because what you're looking to do is, is you're basically looking to, to understand are we on or behind track with our with our goals and plans? Pretty much what you're looking at in here is our, our action plans. And you're looking at it in a lot more detail than you've ever seen before. If you want to dig into more detail. If you want to stay at the high level list, you can do that too. So this month, did you present, did you offer the board a PDF report? From the business office, or is that no, what these are? No, these are all these are all the individual PDFs are all here in this spot. I'd like it's to just reach department. I'd like to know for the record that Brett Ridgeway is substantially ahead of Peter Hiltz in this because I did give you a PDF report, but we're going to move the education office in the same direction that he's moving it, where they will present their they being Amber and Nancy and people that we normally see zone leaders, they will generate their report and place it into. A similar structure in, in Cascade. Where is that in here for you, Brett? The report? Yeah. Well, my report is usually is mostly always the compilation of, of what each individual director or manager is doing. So Paul, Paul and Jim and Ron, so they're the ones that have put together the bulk of the business office report. So you might do maybe a cover right letter or something. So where would I, if I wanted to go in right now to see where your report was today, how would I go in and find that that isn't in my packet because you put it in here? Where's that at? So, uh, are you mean differently than what I've been showing you? Because yes, I thought that's what I was showing you. So we're going to have to look through all of these. There's not just going to be one tab that says the monthly business report. Is that what you're saying? You're going to put them in individual places and not in one lump sum anymore? Like for us just to say, here's February's, here's March's, here's April, like you just did with this. I see. That's my question. Right now, it, 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 is, it is set up to have it in, in these pieces. Uh -huh. Chapters. Yeah. So on your 15th of August report, you get something from Jim or that there's a report from him as part of your report. Yeah, and that's what would have been part of the business office report in the past. What is it? What is he in progress and what's he in planning for in terms of but nothing clicks on that's a PDF on page report, right? Yeah, there it is. Or 
interesting slides. So I, I think we would like to ask you to walk forward with this format and see if it's really obnoxious. If it's not realistic to click in and out of multiple reports every month, we'll learn that. But you may find that it's actually, it lets you be more selective about the sections. I, I don't presume to know who reads thoroughly and who scans. This gives you both options. So, given that it is like this, could there be an additional document that is a one pager from each chief that's inserted each month that also like indexed to our report that month? Yeah. Kind of in a in a you know a one page executive summary so that if I have to prioritize which thing I'm gonna read first or if there's something that's that we really should have our attention drawn to but as lay readers, we might miss unless it was emphasized. I think having a one page executive summary um, in this kind of format would help us. Executive summary slash annotated TOC. Something like that. Does that make sense? To have? Yeah. So an annotated table of contents slash executive summary of, you know, because there may be one or two really big things you want to point our attention to or something each month mm -hmm. as well. But having that guidance and that one pager that we look at first, I think, would probably be helpful in this format. And then that that document you just described could also come to Donna to go into the packet. Yeah. As it has traditionally. Okay. That seems like a reasonable. Because mm -hmm. the only other negative I see on this in terms of doing it this way is those reports in our packet are publicly accessible, and this is not. And so if there's information in there that, and I will give you that the vast majority of our population does not read this stuff in that kind of depth, but there are people who when they're interested in a specific thing or you know are trying to follow something specific, may read those pieces. Um, that level of information is no longer available to our public. I mean, there's an advantage in that you can include confidential things in here. It wouldn't be a part of a public packet. Mm -hmm. Um, but the disadvantage is that there won't be anything in the public packet that stakeholders have access to, and currently stakeholders have access to your board reports. So that's the caveat. Mm -hmm. We may also, as we move through this, want to think about if there is something we want to make sure it's also in the public packet so the public is still able to see it as they have received some of this as they have in the past. That's one opinion. I don't know what others are. Yeah, I can see that they know that it's there, at least something that needs interest. Certainly, I mean, there are certain people that would be, I mean, there are definitely certain people on some of who have been very, you know, great advocates for our district who have used information in those reports in the past, right? Um, and you can, some of those reports are really very closely linked to the 3B in your office. And so someone who's really trying to keep their nose on us and make sure we're doing what we said we were going to do, have a more transparent way of seeing it if they still have access to it. So that'll be something we'll have to think about as we move forward and think about what your balance is that's right, too. Um, and that may be where the one page, or maybe it becomes a one to two page executive summary can be helpful in making sure that we're maintaining some of that transparency. Good. That's good feedback. Thank you. Yeah, because yeah, on this one I would say Jim's, Jim's was a one pager, kind of a routine one pager of, of stuff he's always done, but Paul had some interesting stuff about the ballot annual survey. That's a, that's a big once a year thing that um, that'd be good yeah, in terms of, I would say, hey, make sure you look at that one. And I would have said, I would probably not draw your attention to any of the zone reports because we're just getting going. But the assessment reports that you heard tonight and the PD reports that you heard tonight, those are annual, those are big annual reports. So I probably would have said these are the ones to particularly pay attention to. And then at different times of the year, concurrent enrollment comes on Monday or so. So I think that, that's good feedback. That's why we're doing this, is we wanna we wanna figure out a way to make our communication to you more efficient, but also to make it more um, more obvious.
obvious where we might have a goal that we're not tracking on. Because right now you will right now it's not as, as visible to you if you have fallen behind in some some area. In some planning area, I would say. There are probably you've you've probably seen about five percent of the capacity of this system. There are things that I haven't even touched, much, much less learned, and we're not planning to take you down that rabbit hole. We think the proper use of this tool for this relationship is for us to present action plans and goals and for you to track those action plans and goals. Our monthly reports are reports about our action plans and goals, and so that's why Brett's already included those that I'm planning to. Um, should the board want to learn more, I'm glad to sit with any one of you and go far afield. But right now, this is this is essentially what we think makes sense at this level of, of our communication. And so, if you a while while we were here on on my machine, plugged in as me, I went in and approved the Jim Bowers report. So now, after refreshing it, it doesn't say that no longer says manager pending. It says it's complete because they might make that approval of that. So. It takes time to keep uh, up on us, doesn't it? It does initially. It becomes more, it becomes more routine. Um, and and uh, so it won't, it won't be as time consuming, I think, as we go. And as everyone kind of gets up to a certain level of, of, of fluency in, in, in how, to, how to navigate. How much time do you think a uh, manager, supervisor, director uh, spends on one person that they supervise in the system? 10% of, of their time? Not 10%, no, not 10%, not 1%. But I'll give you a quick example. In order, to, in order to provide you with the part of my CEO report for learning services, that's three pages. There's, there's quite a bit of detail in those three pages. So I have to read all that. I may have to ask, ask some questions about that. Um, I usually have to do some editing to that before it comes to you. And so my sense of it is that this system is less labor intensive than my current system, which is trying to get trying to get hold of down to one page. That's a hard job, and, and I'm not always successful. So you get more from me than, than you want to get. So we would say, and we have about three or four months of playing with this tool, we'd say this is a more efficient tool overall, but you have to invest time setting it up on the front end. It's less efficient now to gain efficiencies down the road. To gain efficiencies and depth, you know, because this, again, what we're really good at this, of course, to, to respond to some great observations that, hey, there's not, there's not consistent understanding of what our strategic goals and where our cultural priorities are from top to bottom in the organization. And so this is a tool that will help us do that. So it's, 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 it's improving that depth and that consistency um, through the organization. I do want to observe there's not, there is no plan, and, and a plan is anything horizontal on the right two thirds of the screen. There is no plan that is not aligned to a cultural or strategic priority. You can't hit save if it's not aligned to a cultural or strategic priority. And so, although we're not taking you there, it gives us as chief officers the opportunity to go in and say, so what are we doing about um, preserving trust? Oh boy, we've only got five or six things that, that are going on, whereas maybe on 49 Pathways we have 25 things. So it allows us to compare where our energy is going or where our focus is going. Now, a lot of our financial stewardship is, is what builds trust. So it may be that you'll see the business office has a, a pretty strong presence there, and maybe the education office needs to have a strong presence there. So it lets us also look at our priorities and see where we're, where we're strong and where we may, might be a little bit unbalanced, or over strong or under strong, but, but out of balance. So that's a, a component of it that we like a lot. Seems to uh, 
force the supervisor to be involved without necessarily having to micromanage. Yep. Okay, so any further, anything else you wanted to show us right now on this? Okay, so, so anything, anybody else has questions on for right now on this? How long is our uh, code and password valid or do we need to change our password and uh, we're asking so Should we change it now or? Yeah. You're, you're welcome to, I would not recommend that okay. at this point. This isn't a highly secure system. Okay. Uh, we're not putting confidential information in here. Um, but uh, for now, I just encourage you to use the password. Use it. Use the password that you have, and you're logging in, and go explore. Right? Um, see where see where it gets you. Yeah. Okay. So then now we're on to the last item, which is the employee outreach structure with the policy yeah. and code of conduct. I'm, I'm sorry. Can I say one more thing about the yes. cascade? No, I'm sorry. Um, just go ahead. as you're exploring. I know. If you if you need people to ask, you know, it's, it's not just Peter who's the expert. We have Danny. Danny is, 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 is being the expert of the business office, and so she may be a, a person that you could you can email question or call or, or stop by and say, hey, I wanted to see these, and email. She may help with that too. So just there will be other folks that can, can assist you. So if you go help button to right. What's that? Looks like there's more help button to write. Um, you can do, you can chat with them. Yes. Yeah. That help button they they in Australia. So Donna's, got, Donna's got chops on this too. Yeah. You guys, there are several so, people. I guess that's the point. So what's the, what's the uh, floating jellyfish you put the left hand just on the entire side of the screw in on your goal? What do they call it? The bigger picture. Oh. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. Yeah, the thing with the, the yeah, this is a circle or a jellyfish or something. Yeah. It's showing it's showing how many how many plans linked to the plan you're looking at. It's, okay. It's a little it's a little abstract even for me. And I got a little not little rest here. Right, because now there's now you're looking at two goals that go in two different directions. I haven't figured out that visual language <laughs> It's from there's no hope for me. Okay. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, it's just. Turn your mic on, Kira, when you're talking. Yes, ma'am. It's being told by the thing. Yeah. Okay, so we're on our last item. Mm -hmm. And so at this point, we need to say whether we do want any revisions to that or do we want it moved forward um, as a first read in our. Um, next thing so that we can then turn it into policy. So we've seen this a few times. I believe you got the, some of your feedback. Um, was there anything feedback wise you needed to share with us from getting it from the um, next layer down in an admin or anything, any refinements that were anything that was changed based on that feedback or was it essentially okay? We, yeah, I think it's essentially okay, okay. from that perspective. Okay, so now board members. Just, I mean, how much different is it from the first version? I can't even remember because we saw that months and months and months ago. I don't think it's much different at this point. I think it got refined a bit, and then we were asked to please provide input, feedback, and comment, and they have heard nothing from any of us other than what was said at the meeting initially when it was shown to us. And so they're waiting for our direction to say, yes, okay, move this forward. So I don't believe there was substantial change to what has been read last time. Um, so at this point, Just make sure we need consensus on it. moving it forward. I just had one quick question because I, I wasn't at. But um, in the visibility tours, the last sentence talks about no more than two board members would schedule tours in a single school year. So I, I'm just, 
and we have so many schools now and if somebody's on just for four years are they only going to get through eight schools with all, all of us or no i think that, that each school is not going to have more than two board members visit here so the other right. way around like you can go to 10, 10 schools but let's not have all five board members show up to the same school in the yes. same year because it's disruptive to the school. I think yeah. that's the way it meant. Seems to be what it says. But that's the kind of feedback we need. I'm just help clarify. trying to clarify that because I was thinking if, and then I was like, okay, you can only go as one board member at a time. Individual board members should not have tours going at the same time. So two of us couldn't go at one time so that they only have to do one. Like two of us going at the same time, they would only have to do one tour a year instead of us doing it two different times. That, that, that was what was just confusing me if we're allowed to do two people at a time at all. How about something like individual DOE members should not have tours at the same location going on at the same time? Is that kind of what you what it's supposed to mean? Do you only want us there? Do you only want prefer is is the school preferring only one person yes. at a time, not two of us at a time? Yes, and. This is in part a realistic response to behavior that preceded this board and the last board and the last board. But you don't have to go too far back in history to find episodes where two board members would show up at a school and it wasn't a constructive visit. I understand where you're going with that. I was thinking it would make it easier on the admin at that school if two people went at one time, but I understand the other side of that now, so thank you. And this is different than us being invited to something. This is a board member initiating. So this would not be like Power Zone sent an invite out to all five of us for the barbecue. Um, if all five of us showed up, that's not what this is talking about because this is them initiating. This is all board member initiated. This refers to board member initiated. That part. That part of it does, yes. Thanks for clarifying. So, so maybe that sentence belongs under ad hoc visits because the edification and visibility tour is a pre planned, mm -hmm. invited slash scheduled tour. And what you're talking about where that last sentence is concerning is where people just show up together to basically well, harass scheduled. the school. Or they could have scheduled together at their request. Mm -hmm. I think this is about board member request instead of school request. No, it says right? carefully timed and playing with staff meeting and leaders. Right, so it would be you requesting. So we could say, Donna, John and I want to go to Delphin High. And Donna, and because we initiated the request, Donna didn't schedule it. Yet. That would come under this because that was still pre planned, but it wasn't initiated by the staff inviting us to it. I think that's what they're trying to say. But I, I think we'd like a crack at, at clarifying that because because that who initiates it and, and who coordinates it makes a, difference. makes a difference. And so this is good feedback for us. This is kind of the, the dialogue we were hoping to have is to make sure. It makes sense. And understanding the spirit behind it is to make these interactions as productive as, as possible. But to recognize that your prominence in a school building is, is a dynamic that school leaders should have an opportunity to prepare for. Yeah. Well, that's why it says pre planned and all that other stuff. I, you know, I kind of almost believe you need to add something to ad hoc where, you know, um, Kind of like where that's that sentence is should you know also at least belongs under ad hoc because yeah. that's what you're really talking about. You don't want two board members right showing up and surprising people, and that's what an ad hoc meeting is according to this definition. But it may also mm -hmm. belong there, I would say. But now, yeah. If you keep if you keep it up where edification and visibility is, I mean I know you want to look at it to clarify 
Maybe just simply at, a, at the same location, you know, the same meeting, the same tour, you know, something like that. So I think we can, I think we can make those adjustments and add it in the ad hoc section as well. Yeah, because ad hoc, a lot of the ad hoc is, is things that happen just because many of us are in the buildings because we have children in them, and so you show up as a parent and you're. I know you have had to deal with that, but some of us have. So you show up as the parent, and because you're there and available, plenty of times things are brought to you. And so knowing how to kind of, having some guidelines around how that's handled can be helpful. There's a reason I'm in the drive-in pickup line most days now, and it's to control some of that piece so that something inappropriate doesn't well, I understand the spirit. I'm the rookie guy making a mistake, perhaps. I, when I went to the open houses and the uh, Ridgeview orientation day, I was just there to just see and wander around and not garner any attention. And they loved having me just be there. Like, oh, we're glad you're here. Thanks for coming and showing up. And you know, I wasn't trying to to do any of the investigatory or particular issue. I was just there to be present. Which right. is that visibility piece. And so I kind of see. Well, that's more or less being invited too. Yeah. Right. The tour, 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 tour is when you say, "Hey, I want to go see every school in the power zone." Yeah, and so I want to I want to go meet with every principal in every school in the power zone. That's what a tour okay. is. And a coordinated visit is, "Hey, I want to talk about standardized grading at Falcon High School. I need to go talk to Cheryl." Okay, the ad hoc is is when you when you're there, and someone starts to explore an issue with you. I'm just or or you well, show up yeah. to explore an issue. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then, and kind of, you know, you were, we were sent as board members, we were sent the dates of open houses. So that's you being invited to the school, right. which is completely different than something you, you didn't do a rookie mistake there. No. You did something no. that no, no, schools no. appreciate in that all the dates of the open houses were there. So that in case someone would like to come by, we could come by. And, but that was in, that you were essentially invited by default by being given that. No. But I guess that's just thinking. Well, yes, that was an invitation. I'm also seeing sort of an open invitation, period, from the schools. And you're, like, for instance, the As, school said, yeah, come back anytime. Like, correct. You're welcome to be present. And I, and I don't want to garner attention. I'm just bored just to be I up here. And if I run into a parent or a PTA or something like that, I'd be happy to, to answer questions that would not limit that. Uh, one principal even took just some time to talk to me. And I was like, well, I'm not asking for your attention because you're busy talking about families and other things. So I, I, I want to disrupt the normal course of business. So it's almost like a sense that in the education, edification, visibility tours, there could be a portion there that might describe just being there. I know without that, I'm kind of a word I'm not a board member, but, but I do know, I have learned this. If I go into a building, the principal deserves to know that I have to go there. Because it makes them anxious if I'm there and they don't know why, because, and I'm not a board member, right? I'm, I'm an executive, but it makes them anxious. I've, I've seen principals visibly flushed because they perceive the presence yeah. of somebody in a governance role or an executive sure. role as as something to be concerned about. And we're just trying to, to clarify that that's not why we're there. Sure. Um, we're there for very appropriate reasons. And it's actually a sign of real health for a board to say, we want to make sure that the building leaders understand that we're there for appropriate reasons. A lot of boards like to be able to. There's, there's power in just dropping in and just showing up. And as a board, I think you're committing to not exercise that kind of power, but to exercise your relational power, which is really admirable. That's what I'm about. And a part of this ultimately is so that staff know what the expectations are for board members so that if people step outside those bounds they can be comfortable saying you know what i'm uncomfortable with this and knowing you know what it's okay to say hey this is starting to happen or i'm having an issue it gives them a fallback place um, to be able to have some of that um, some of that assurance that no this really isn't okay and it's okay for you to say you know what I'd love to have you come back another time, but I really can't take you through my building right now because I have 1,200 students I'm supervising right now. This is not a good day for me to walk you through my building. They need permission to be able to hold us accountable and to do and to be that assertive, 
but without a policy in place, um, it makes it very difficult. They don't have, they don't feel like they have something to stand on. And the reality of it truly being, we don't have power unless we're sitting up here, is not how people experience it because too often they give us power we don't have. Oh, I just in the edification visibility tours. I read between the lines. Is that's uh, one of us as a board member having a personal agenda that we're inserting into the school by showing up. We're not there really to learn. We're there to be highly visible, to um, push power we have. I really, and that's based on some historical context and places. We are talking about that. Idea. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to say, but I hope Kevin had said it very nicely earlier on that we're, we're trying to move past all of that. So when you're writing this, don't get stuck in the past by what other people have done, but your expectations of what you want to want a, a board to be is what I would hope you would base this on, not cast behavior that hasn't been as appropriate as maybe it should have been. So I'm hoping that at some point we can get that better balance and just look more towards a positive future and not constantly be looking at that and looking backwards. I, well, yeah, I, I think we are because we're not because okay. we're not writing this as a, a as a list of do not do's. Okay. It's it's more of hey, when you want to do this, here's how we really prefer and suggest you do that type of thing. So, and, and it, it, it's, so it's, it's trying to have a positive spin, but also making sure that, that, that the boundary is there so that we can't regress. I was going to say is, I think if you read that paragraph without knowing the history mm -hmm. and without having lived through some of the history, um, you might, I, you, you and I both see it because we know, right? Kevin sees it because he, he lived through pieces of it. So we read it with a different eye than someone who's a brand new board member might read it who will take that as guidance because you know with the director districts for each 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 person's gonna have an area where they really should be trying to be more visible and building those relationships because the expectation in that director district is you're bringing that community's voice back. And so there'll be things that you try to that you know if you if you've only got elementary school kids in your zone, you might want to schedule some tours and get to know what a middle school and high school are like and make concerted efforts to build relationships in there. And the way you may do that is through these tours. Um, and that isn't necessarily a bad thing. That will help you represent the yeah. zone as a whole better. We did try to strike that balance, create a positive expectation within boundaries. If Mr. Cruzen felt like, because of his role in the campaign, he wants to go around to the schools and, and just find out how 3B is actually rolling out, that'd be very positive. And that and that would be you would be edified by that. And then you would come back to the board and have more <coughs> yeah. totally appropriate. Yeah. And so we wanna we want to speak to that appropriate, productive, constructive relationship. And I, I read author most of this, he did a really good job speaking without without being trapped in the past. But we appreciate you guys help us. Tighten it up so that ten years from now somebody looks at this and says, "Hey, this I aspire to be this kind of board member." Or two years from now, I honestly look at this and I don't see. I don't know what your definition of positive or productive is, but I don't see positive. I don't see positive. Uh, I don't see any of the tours that I did represented in any of this. We, we thought so my tours weren't for people to get to know me. I don't want anybody bailing me if I can help. No, but we thought those were that, that is what we normally we wrote this thing. When you went out and connected with departments and schools, they appreciated that. And we we wanted to preserve that right. and exclude non positive. Other than <laughs> so, so that actually is part of what we were we were thinking about with the edification, right? Okay, so you know, I I don't look at it as a visibility of a board member. I look at it as it's a, you know because you know the board member tried to make themselves visible, 
is not necessarily uh, the best thing. We're, but the board member, what I look at it as, is it's more supportive of your programs, of your school, of, of you know. That's what my role was, so maybe I just understand. Well, or maybe that comes more under coordinating with it being also so not necessarily just about a concentrated time frame for an issue or strategy, but also to learn mm -hmm. aspects of the district because your tours are more like a learning, like trying to learn and understand understand how the different pieces fit together and what different people did. I and mean, that's what was happening at the central office piece. It, so maybe it, that was a piece of it, but I don't know. No, it's, it's actually very curious. You you need to visibility as you being visible. I help write it as you're gaining visibility into the programs. Right, right, right now, I'm kind of your access to career technical education, mm -hmm. but you got visibility on that program by going and meeting with Nikki and her team. And we think that was a constructive, positive, Absolutely. Thing. I have so many things to be an advocate for since I've had those meetings. And yeah. A few schools that I've toured and got to talk to teachers about and uh, and staff, you know, because I talked to just more than teachers. Uh, you know, it's a uh, it's one of those things where, and I don't know that the policy right now captures it, but the board members need to be supportive and. Uh, I don't know if that's from the mentor relationship or not, but you know, obviously, board members can be destructive too, uh, and that's what we want to avoid. We want to we want to be able to make sure that people feel heard, that people feel supported, mm -hmm. uh, and also that the, the board member learns, you know, the roles and responsibilities and concerns of others. But also, uh, in one of these, and I think it's uh, letter uh, section number two on the second page. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I agree that an individual board member does not have authority apart from the full board, you know, blah, 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 and making commitments. I would suggest that maybe in that area, you have a, uh, I'm, I'm not sure how, you explained it to me when I had a question that someone presented to me from one of my visits. And it's basically connecting with the right chief to bring that quite not attributable question to light so that the board member can then be able to, you know, speak smartly about it or direct, not direct someone, but at least know next time they're asked, you know, what about this? Oh, you got to talk to Paul Anderson about HR stuff. You know, he will answer your questions, you know, but I, I think it's missing, like, I can't remember what it was, but you and I had talked about it about, uh, you know, if there's any concerns after a visit, just instead of a board member trying to resolve it on their own, mm -hmm. which we don't want, mm -hmm. they forward whatever that concern is to the appropriate chief officer that to then filter it to whoever it needs to go to. Or, or, or find or, out from the chief officer how to redirect that concern. Yeah. So you can't yeah. It's basically more of a request for information, not a request for action. It, it strikes me as, as we are working on board onboarding modules that we're going to be building mm -hmm. in collaboration with Donna. This could be one of our first priorities is, is since we've had this recent fresh discussion in some depth and we're current on this, we're currently working this policy, maybe that would be one of the first one or two that we want to build. And so I'll, I'll take that and yeah, that's all part of the role of board member. Don't yeah. don't request action. You know, just forward the concern or the information. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's something that can be added to number five on that page that kind of gives that guidance. Yeah, follow them up. Right. So it says, you know, appropriate care should be followed to ensure they're understood before picking up the agenda. It can be, you know, when concerns are brought here, help me maybe to, you know, request information from the chief or ask for clarity from a chief officer. This is an excellent so conversation because it gives us, I mean, I understand what we're writing better, having heard you think out loud about it. Yeah, and I understand quite a bit better than I did before. So thank you. Here's a thought approach too. I would say that based upon my visits, it's been more of a hospitality opportunity for the uh, not the administration, but for the building staff, mm -hmm. because I found them very welcoming, almost as if they're selling the school, not necessarily to me, but in terms of if we're saying the best choice to, to lead work and pull in. Uh, 
or learn or believe. That's an opportunity for them to say, here's what our school is about. So I almost saw me as a guinea pig of, hey, you know, I practice on that. Maybe they'd get feedback from it. Maybe they wouldn't, but it would be sort of that hospitality piece of, hey, we're selling our school to me of what they're about and what they do in that particular place. I, is there a spot for that? Here? Well, I, I totally see edification and visibility as a two-way street. Is each side is being identified, each side is seeing the other. No, it doesn't mean you know, if, if you're just doing not doing that on a, on a tour per se, and it's just a, a visit. Yeah. Um, still, most of these are always two two way. When I first saw this, I don't sorry. really I felt like I was getting a little handcuffed. Like, hey, you can only do this. And, you know, Kevin and I can only go to one school, and everybody else can't go to that school. I almost felt like, well, why? But I understand the direction based on history, but I also see the opportunity as well for that almost building further relationships and deeper connections with, with them and deeper trust mm -hmm. too. And that's why I, you know, I think point three, you know, the beginning of point three on that second page mm -hmm. is, is really that's maybe the biggest phrase on there. Communication and clarity is of intent is, is paramount. Sure. Well, and I would say okay. if, if we're saying that edification and visibility if the intent is to make it to be the two-way street message, then maybe adding something in that sentence so that, because when it says for their own edification to promote their visibility and presence, it definitely, yeah. if you read it, it implies just board member, but you could say, um, and to promote visibility of board member and programs, or you could add something in there so that your your interpretation when you read it and someone else's interpretation actually you kind of confirm the, the two way street piece just by maybe mm -hmm. adding a couple of extra words to that sentence. So it doesn't sound like everyone's trying to be selfish when they say, "Can I come to your school?" Yeah, I think that's uh, you know in there. I think the uh, transparency and building the trust is also very important. You know because you really you know you want the board members have to build trust with their community, but they also have to build trust with, you know, the staff and faculty, the key, you know, the leaders, the employees, and that's by acting professionally and above board, mm -hmm. by building that trust, by building that, uh, you know, those, those, those levels of transparency, where there's no hidden agendas, you know, and people aren't acting unprofessional. Okay, so do you have the guidance you need? Um, so the tweaks seem to me that many, that would you be able to do those tweaks in time for a first read at the September board meeting? At the regular meeting, or do we need to push it to a September work session? I think I'd like, I think I'd like for us to, to move forward on it, knowing that, yeah. you know, this, we can always keep editing it as we, right, you know, so right. Yeah, I think we, I think we, we can make those tweaks, and I think like together we know okay this that's, that's just a good starting point for us and so we'll do a that's first grade of the september board meeting yeah. with a plan to approve at the october okay does that sound appropriate to everyone yes all right there we go and are you are you saying that the regular meeting or the work session in september regular well we said you bring it back as your first read at regular so we would have an approval okay. by october right okay, okay. Yes. That's the right. Yeah. yeah I mean, we could count this as the first read. Would, you would you guys rather just count this as the first read and do the approval next time? Yes. yes. With updates. Okay. okay. Yeah. I think exactly. we can make that suspense. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Then let's do that. Okay. Because this can count as in first read, right? Yeah. All right. It's not the agenda. Out of this policy. Okay. And then we're good. All right. So with that, I believe. Oh, one other business piece. I almost forgot an email. I'm sorry. Um, we had been, the district was asked whether we would be willing to give a, I don't you know, um, exist, there's a park in, an existing park in Falcon Highlands, which wants to apply for a GoCo grant, one of the grants that is um, for improving parks, the GoCo mini grant, mm -hmm. to be able to improve the park. Um, so that the kids in the neighborhood have a place to play that is appropriate to older children and not just toddlers, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're allowed to have up to seven letters of support, and they reached out to us to see if we would be willing to provide a letter of support where this is not... Um, 
this is not this would not be allocation of new land in anything. This is the Falcon Highlands Metro District asking us if we would be willing to put in a support letter for them. Um, I wanted to bring it to all of you before saying something. I don't know if there would be any downsides to it. Personally, I see it as an opportunity to um, support another entity in our community um, and get kids who live in our community who attend our schools another option to be healthy, to have a better park to play at. Um, Concur. Me too. All right, so consensus as we do it. <laughs> Yeah. It really is an obvious choice to support. Yeah. Such an I would think so, but I am not going to be a unilateral, and I wanted to bring it to everyone instead of directing someone to do something on my own. Right, it's important. It's appropriate for the board to be making that decision, and not and even even to making that that official endorsement rather than an employee. Yeah. So, so, um, so that, does that mean y'all want me to write the letter, or can we delegate that? I'd actually prefer to have Rachel Durant as our. That would be awesome. And Lou Fletcher, as our director of cultural services, collaborate on the letter. Okay. And they may draft it and ask for your signature, which I think would be even okay. more meaningful. Sure. So yeah, but if you have it for me, that'd be awesome. Thank you. I love when I don't have to write it and I just get to sign it. We're done. Second. <laughs> 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 <laughs>